butterfly in the sky I can go twice as high Take a look, it's in a book A reading rainbow Hello and welcome to the 350th episode of the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here to talk about stuff. We are halfway to 700 episodes. Um, This is, I guess, our our latest milestone. Um, And because we have been doing sort of special list episodes on our big milestones for a while now, we did something for for episode 200, we revisited our favorite films. For 250, I think, was games. For 300 was TV shows. So we were trying to think, well, what's left? And uh, deciding to scrape the bottom of the barrel, uh, we finally went with an idea that we've had for a long time, and we're both kind of on the fence about doing. But now that we're here, I'm really excited we're doing it, and that is... We are today, Sean, talking about our top 10 favorite books. Books, literature, yes. not something we've gotten to talk too much on the show about. But Sean, you were an English major. You are an English teacher. I read a lot of books. So why the hell not? Yes, I know that Like we've never really talked about book stuff on this podcast before. I've brought up a couple of books I've read occasionally while we did the podcast. Some of them might be on my list. But it's not a... I don't know. It's not a thing we talk about on the podcast much, but it is a thing that occupies uh, a huge portion of my life at the very least. So might might as well do it. Yeah, I think it's going to be fun. I think, you know, as I was putting it together, Sean, I realized, you know, man, there's a lot of stuff on here that's like very formative to me and very important to me that I've literally just never talked about on the podcast. Some of this I have. You can all probably guess what my number one is because we've talked about it. Uh, And I know some of the ones that you will have, Sean, because I know you, like, discovered them while we did the podcast and you talked about them. Um, Mm -hmm. But, like, you know, I'm sure, like, like, this is the one where I feel the least sure of what's on your list, Sean. I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, this was the... Yeah, this is, like, the list that I think... There's a couple of things that I'm sure if people are longtime listeners of the podcast, they'd be able to guess some of them. Um, But a lot of this stuff, probably not. I don't know. It is. It's it again. It's just something we never really talk about much. Even though it is for me, like I have to say, making this list, it is my favorite list I've made because I'm like, oh wait, this is all stuff that I know. I know way more about all the stuff than I do anything else we've ever done on this podcast. Um, so it's like, oh shit, right? I like this is this is shit I know a lot about and have studied for years, um, and like continue to do, like every single day basically now that I'm an English teacher. So I am very excited to to dig into it. Well, it's fun because when we do video game lists, we're very much meeting in the middle on that because we both do this the same amount, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. which is as kind of a a hobbyist critic kind of thing. When we do films, that's like my area of academia. So I it occupies a lot of my brain space and we're doing books. It's the opposite. It occupies more of your brain space than it does mine. So it also like I don't know if you felt this with the film list, Sean, but I felt this with this is that I'm like I had like way less. I don't know, like, uh, it was just like, I could just be like, okay, these are my favorite books. I don't have to, like, there's there's no, like, I'm not thinking about, like, but did I include enough from, like, the 1920s or something um, that gets mm-hmm. in my head or whatnot? Um, and so that was fun. And, and I'm, I'm really curious to hear your side of this because, again, we just, you know, we get to hear from you every so often on literature stuff, but not enough. Yeah, and I'm excited to hear what's on your list because there's a couple of things that I'm pretty sure I know would be on there, but there's a lot that, like, I have absolutely no idea. No, we, I don't think, because you and I primarily talk while doing the podcast these days, you and I have not, like, just sat down and talked books probably since high school. Maybe college, maybe some in college. Yeah, definitely some in college, um, but yes, not, we, it's been, it's been a while. We talked about books a lot in high school because we were in the same English class. <laughs> um, yes. But yes, so... All right. Well, that'll be our main topic today. Um, You know, I mean, man, 350 is a big number. I don't know if we're going to continue to do this for like 
every 50 episodes, but it is fun to do like one of these every year. 400, we'll have to figure out something big for, and then past that point, we'll see. Uh, it depends on if the world is still here. Um, I feel like we'll probably get to 400 with the world still around, but I don't know. Uh, past that, I'm not going to make any fucking predictions. Yes, but yes, I, I, I hope and I believe that we will run out of lists to do before humanity has gone extinct. That's my, that's my hope. That's, I think that's a good, I think that's a good goal. We want to keep the warming down enough that we have more lists to do. Or, exactly. Yeah. Or just do more lists if the warming gets worse. Anyway, yeah. So thank you all for listening for 350 episodes. Um, yes. That's fucking crazy. And when we add on all the Weekly Suit Gundam stuff, it's just a lot. It's a lot. And it's fun. Um, but Sean, do you have any stuff for us today? We're not, we don't really have any news on the outline I could bitch about Zack Snyder's Justice League being clearly just a complete remake of that movie because there was no Snyder cut, and now they're putting Jared Leto in it. But I don't. I don't want to. I just don't. I don't. Yeah, and I. My guess is we will probably revisit that at a future date when there is. There's going to be more news about that, and we'll probably just do like a wrap up or something at some point of just like what the fuck <sighs> is all this. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but for me, uh, I do have. I guess, like, kind of two pieces of stuff. One is I've continued to play Genshin Impact. Um, I don't know if I have anything, like, more to say about that game other than that it is still very good. Um, and I play at least a little bit of a uh, little bit of it every day. Um, and that, uh, yeah, it's just a fantastic game, and I'm enjoying the shit out of it. But the other thing I did last night was I booted up Google Stadia for the first time since we did that one podcast on it because there is a free demo of a video game called Phoenix. I cannot, I've already forgotten the name of this fucking game. Um, the not Breath of the Wild game from Ubisoft. Um, I'm going to type that into Wikipedia and see if it says, yes, that is the name of a video game. Because I know it's, I know it's Phoenix. So we were talking about, right now we're talking about the Ubisoft Breath of the Wild clone that was originally called Gods and Monsters yes. and is now called what, Sean? Phoenix, 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 something. Phoenix, I'm just gonna call it Phoenix. Okay. Phoenix Immortals, Phoenix Rising. That's why it was not coming up. We had all the words in the title. We just didn't have them in the right order. Um, it's which is frustrating because Phoenix is the only thing that I can remember about the title because that's the name of the main character. Um, so it was they say Phoenix a bunch. Um, but yes, it, the game wants to call the gods and monsters a much better title, a much easier title to remember. I think there, it eventually came out there, there was some, like, weird, um, like, copyright thing around, like, Monster Energy Drink or some shit that seems like another reminder of that copyright laws in the United States are just completely fucked if you can't even call a game Gods and Monsters because there's an energy drink brand called Monsters. Um, but so there is a short, I would say probably, like, 20 minutes-ish demo of uh, Immortals Phoenix Rising on Stadia that you can access for free. It is like the only good use of Stadia I have encountered so far. Um, I will say that in terms of the Stadia part of the experience, it was like totally fine. Um, it's the, it, it was not any different than the last time we talked about it in that if I play it at my desk, um, it is mostly fine with like a couple of occasional hitches. If I try to move my computer anywhere closer to my TV and plug it into my TV, it just doesn't work. And I still have no idea why. It is the only thing I do with the internet that, that, that there is any... Dis detectable disparity between this and like 10 feet from where i am right now um but i did try to plug it in my tv it just didn't work um but so i played it off my just my laptop screen and paid the play the 20 minutes demo uh and it's pretty good um it is very much a breath of the wild like um i feel kind of bad for the game that it's coming out um, right after both Genshin Impact and Hades, because it very much feels like a, here's a Greek mythology thing, and everyone's loving the shit out of Hades, and then here's a Breath of the Wild thing, and everyone's loving the shit out of Genshin Impact, and it's kind of doing some of that stuff. Um, and I don't think it's doing either of that side that well, um, but it's not doing it terribly either. In terms of the story and like the setting and that kind of stuff, it's sort of generic Greek mythology kind of setting, that has a very, I think, bad um, sort of DreamWorks movie-esque humor to it of where the whole story is framed as Zeus talking to Prometheus um, and they are telling the story of Phoenix going on this adventure. Um, and for the demo, it's this sort of like weird 
version of like the Cyclops story from the Odyssey. Um, and they just kind of pull out a bunch of like random references from the Odyssey of like Circe and Polyphemus, the Cyclops, and Odysseus and his and blah 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 blah. Um, and Pro and uh, Prometheus is trying to tell the story as it actually supposedly happened. And then Zeus keeps on interrupting him and says, like, and, but no, something crazy and wacky happened. Like, the Cyclops shoots lasers out of his eyes. And when Zeus adds in a piece of commentary, what he says happens, happens in the game. Which I think is a decent concept. Like, other games have done stuff like that, and it's been cool. I think, like, the humor for me just falls completely flat. Um, and again, in a, like, bad animated, 3G animated movie kind of way um, that... I've just, I'm not entirely sure why they went for this sort of weird humor tone when I think it would have been probably better for them to play it relatively straight. Um, but then once you get past that stuff, you're playing the game and the demo doesn't give you any sort of, of the open world or anything to explore. You're in this sort of side area that I suspect is basically this game's version of the plateau from Breath of the Wild and that it does feel tutorially. So you, you know, unlock your glider and you glide to these different little like kind of islands. Um, and you do some of the combat stuff. The combat's fairly similar to the modern Assassin's Creed Origins and Odyssey. So it's that kind of R1 for light attack, R2 for heavy attack. You you have some special abilities that are assigned to face buttons. And you like hold down L1 and then press one of the face buttons to do a special move. And so the combat feels good. Um, it is like even playing on Stadia, it felt very responsive. There's a, I think, pretty smart stamina system um, that you kind of break enemies by using your heavy attacks. Um, and then using the light attack refills your stamina. So if you use the heavy attack, it drains your stamina, but it also hurts the enemy's stamina. And then light attacks hurt their health and gives your stamina back so you can do more special moves or heavy attacks. So I do think that like the combat design feels pretty sharp um, and, and that kind of stuff I think is pretty strong. I think the stuff that didn't fully pull me in with the game is one, I think it was a mistake not having any of the open world stuff in the demo because it's, is because that's like the appeal to one of these games is seeing something in the distance and going and finding it and doing something with it. Like that was what was fun with Breath of the Wild. That's what's the most fun with Genshin Impact. And this has a lot of the same sort of mechanics as those games in terms of being able to glide and climb on everything and all that stuff. But if you don't get to t a taste of the open world, it's hard to sort of get a sense of how the game's going to go in that regard. And it's, I, it's like nothing in it is particularly bad. It's just a lot of like the level design... And that kind of stuff just is sort of like uninspiring. And so when you don't get any of the open world stuff that I think could potentially in the actual full game be a lot better than that. When you only have this one sort of like marked off area. It, I did feel like by the time I was done with the 20 minutes, I was like, that was kind of cool. But I'm kind of done with it um, in a way that did not necessarily inspire me to want to pick up the full game. Yeah, that it's it's I have to say, like, if I if I want to play Breath of the Wild like. It's going to be Genshin Impact. Yes. And obviously, if I was going to recommend Greek mythology to someone, I'm going to recommend Hades, because Hades is such a smart, creative, canny, like, presentation of Greek mythology, and that I think if you're at all a nerd for it, you'll recognize how much it gets it, but also, like, builds on it, and it sounds like this is shallower in kind of both of those directions. Because it also sounds like Genshin Impact, from everything you've said, has some genuine, like, innovations in how it's combining different systems and it does not sound oh, yeah. like gods and monsters so far from what we've seen has any of that um it does i will say i like the idea of demos being over streaming that is the mm -hmm. perfect use for game streaming right now because if it's a demo i don't really care if there are little hiccups right but yeah. it would be nice to be able to do that without downloading you know however big it might be this probably isn't a huge download if you were to do it but you know it would be really nice to just be able to like hit the button and try the demo and that would actually be a cool use for like x cloud on xbox um and i you know if sony expands their streaming at any point like i don't necessarily need to stream full games but it would be great if you were in the store and you could say hey would you like to try half an hour of this game and you hit a button and you're just trying it and then if you like it you could buy it that would be really cool yeah i agree and that was to me like the best part of the whole experience was just this like hearing that this demo was available on stadia for free I'm like, well, I already made that Stadia account, and it's just my Google account, so I might as well try it out. And it and that just worked, and that was cool. And again, like, the game is not bad in any way. Like, I think there are going to be, I suspect there will be people that are going to really like this game. Um, 
and I think those people are people that will, for whatever reason, just have not played Genshin Impact, basically. Um, but uh, <laughs> because because it is like if it had if Genshin Impact had not come out, I think I would have felt very differently about the game and been more impressed by it. But there was just this feeling of I just kind of want to go back and play. I just want to play more Genshin Impact and level up my characters and go find the like weird secrets in the world and that kind of stuff. Um, and so I feel a little bit bad for the game. I will say, like, I think one of the reasons why its comparison to Genshin Impact is left favorable for Immortals Phoenix Rising um, is that it doesn't have any of that kind of environmental, like, elemental kind of stuff that, I mean, Zelda is, like, chock full of. And Genshin Impact doesn't have it to the level of Zelda, but it does have these really novel interactions with the environment based on the elements that you're using. I mean, you can just, in you know, Genshin Impact just has really cool moments where you're fighting on top of a lake because you're using an ice character and you're reusing your ice ability to freeze the surface of the lake so that you can fight enemies on top of it. Like, there's a lot of really cool stuff like that where the world interacts with each other with elements in it in uh, surprising ways. And at least in the demo, there was not a lot of that in Phoenix or Immortals Phoenix Rising. There was a little bit of like you could lift up a rock and like do, like throw it through a wall and break the wall and find secrets. And it has a little bit of physics-y stuff in it and a little bit of Zelda-ish puzzles um, where they do like the most sort of um, what, like ice ice baby to under pressure version of the treasure jingle from uh <laughs> zelda or like the you solve the puzzle the ba 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 bum like it has that only it just feels like it kind of is like ba 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 bum and it's like it's very <laughs> you guys are like treading on thin ice more so than any of the shit in genshin impact where genshin impact does basically rip off some stuff from breath of the wild that was the one that i feel like this is a step too far you can because this isn't even just breath of the wild this is just legend of zelda at some point you can't just do the you just can't do the puzzle solve the jingle from Legend of Zelda and just pass it off. Like, that's not okay. Um, also, I feel so like, like music is where if you do rip something off, that's when people get litigious. You mm -hmm. can rip off graphical elements all fucking day. Who cares? But if you're going to rip off music, then you've got music lawyers coming after you. Yeah, because there is, I think, yeah, because there is like a certain science to what music is that is a lot easier to point at and say, like, this is just the same thing. Um, only you, this is like a half note instead of a quarter note. And that's not enough of a difference versus like, it sort of looks similar. It's a little bit harder to quantify with an art style. Um, but yeah, like it's, I guess I don't know if I have any more to say about Immortals Phoenix Rising. Um, I, I feel bad for the game cause I think it does have some cool stuff in it that just, I don't think is, I don't think the game is going to do particularly well. Um, because almost entirely because of Genshin Impact. Like I think that game will have just eaten immortal phoenix rising's launch completely when it launches so fun um yeah. i am still playing hades every week i think i'm going to be done with hades next week and i think i will have moved on to something else and every week my play clock has gone up a precipitous amount and i am very much not done with hades and i am now pushing 80 hours in hades and um I love it to death. It is a warm comfort blanket at this point. It started as this like hard, tough as nails, roguelike, and I'm just struggling to make it to the end. And now it's like, you know, I could do it with, with one eye closed and it would be fine. Um, it's, But it's just so fun. There's still so much that I'm discovering in terms of some of the story stuff that I can't believe there's... I hit a point where I thought I was kind of out of story and then I realized some systems I had been neglecting. And there's some more character stuff that I've been doing. I have reunited Orpheus and Eurydice. I have helped Achilles reunite with his lover Patroclus. I have done all sorts of things for my friend in the un friends in the underworld, and I feel so good. I have fallen in love with a gorgon's head. It's great. Um, but yeah, Sean, Sean, raise an eyebrow at that one. You'll get it if you ever play it, Sean. But yeah, I, I, th I maybe I'll be done with Hades this time next week. I would like to move on to other stuff. I would really like to try Genshin Impact. But Hades, I just don't know how to quit you, and I do look forward to the end of the year podcast when I will feel more comfortable spoiling some parts of this game so I can discuss it more fulsomely. But for now, I will just again say, good God, if you are not playing Hades, please play Hades and share in, in my mania of not being able to put down this fucking game. I mean, at this point, you know, we're like two and a half weeks away from the new consoles coming out. You might as well just write it out. Just I might. Until then. Like that was kind of that's kind of how I'm feeling about Genshin Impact. That I was like looking at it and like thinking about well, what other stuff could I play? 
And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to ride this out all the way to the new consoles in Spider-Man or Demon's Souls, whichever one I play first. Yeah. Um, I Might as well. I did pick up the Doom DLC for Doom Eternal. Um, the first DLC pack, which is... It's just basically a new campaign. And I mm-hmm. played a little bit of the first level, and I will say, the like, I'm, I'm going to play it at some point. I want to get into it. The problem is, it is the kind of DLC that starts you, like, at the end of the game with all your shit and no tutorial right. again. And I'm like, I do not remember all the interlinking systems in Doom Eternal because that game is so complicated at a certain point. And then I went and played Hades because I was just like, I don't have... I was like trying to start it at like 11.30 at night and I'm like, I do not have the mental bandwidth to remember how to play Doom Eternal. Um, Yeah, I might this coming week finally sit down and play Resident Evil 7 because it's the one I I haven't played yet and it's Halloween week and I've been meaning to do that. And that probably is, you know, I could play that in a couple nights. So, yeah. Yeah. I will just continue to play Genshin Impact. I, like, that sounds I, good. I, yeah, it's just it is, <laughs> it is. It's like because it's not. I, I feel like I'm addicted to it, but not in the way that like it sounds like you're addicted to Hades. It's just more of a just like I'm tired and it is so comfortable. Like it is like the most comfortable game in the world to play. It's just you can put it on for like 30 minutes, do a couple of daily missions, just listen to the very good music in the second zone. That is just so good. Um, and blow some stuff up with crazy uh, lightning magic with my cool pirate queen, and then go to be it, and then go to sleep, and just basically, I almost fall asleep playing the game sometimes. It's just like I'm so exhausted these days. It's like, oh, <laughs> oh, this game is just so nice. It's just a warm blanket, and I'm just picking up weird flying orbs that are called some dumb shit in the English localization, and it's just so comfortable. There's no coronavirus in it. There's no stupid fascist uh, orange cheese puff. It's just, it's just fun. Yes, it's just a fun, happy world. It's like one thing that like I do, I think it's, it, it sort of highlighted something for me that was a kind of personal thing that maybe didn't resonate with me about Breath of the Wild that kind of pushed me a little bit away from that game is Breath of the Wild is effectively a post-apocalypse game. Um, and there was something about that that at a certain point I didn't like enjoy living in that world versus Genshin Impact where it is just lively and it's just there are people around and they're just living their lives and having a good time and there's not like... There's no sort of Damocles hold like hanging above everything, just waiting for like the shoe to drop and for all of humanity to be wiped out or something. It's just like, no, people are just having a good time. And yeah, there are bad people and there there's like a vague antagonist that exists in the world out there somewhere. But you don't really have to worry about it too much. You just, you just have fun. Um, and there's something about that I, I really enjoy about an open world game when it's like there's no big world ending cataclysm on the horizon. It's just you're just hanging out and it's cool. Nice. All right, well, should we go ahead and move on to today's episode 350 spectacular topic? Yes, we probably should, because I I've, I have absolutely no idea how long this topic is going to be. It's either going to be, like, the shortest of all of these top ten lists, or it's going to be the longest, and I have no idea. Well, if you have to make a bet on this podcast, bet for longest. But let's go ahead and see, Sean. So we each have a list of our top ten favorite books. You also have some sub-lists. Do you want to do those now or later? Um, yeah, we should do those at the top, um, but I guess at first before we do that, I guess maybe talk a little bit about like the our philosophy for putting together lists and all that kind of stuff, because I feel like that's how we usually go with this. Cause it is. Because I feel like top 10 books is a like really broad thing compared to top 10 movies, top 10 video games. Like what is a movie um, and what is a video game are fairly well defined. What constitutes a book is a slightly more complex thing, I think, because of how long the history of literature as a, like, cultural phenomenon is. So I want to get a sense, Jonathan, like, what was the kind of stuff you looked at? What were you, like, thinking about um, in terms of how you put together your list? It's all picture books. uh, Fewest words possible. I just went with, uh, I have a lot of art books on here. I have a book of Van Gogh paintings, just, you know, books that are the easiest for me to look through. At the, no, um, I mean, but that's that's the joke, right? That's why it's hard, yeah. right? Um, mm-hmm. Because you could go with just your favorite sets of pages bound together, and that is a book, right? That's all, that's all book means. And, yeah. you know, today, is that even what book means because of ebooks and stuff? Um, yeah, I, I was fairly loose with this definition because I think the easy way to do this would have been to limit it to fictional stories as books, like novels or something. Um, that was not fully representative for me, and so most of mine are novels in that sense of, of fictional narratives. But I have a couple of other things. I have one like very weird outlier, and I have one semi-weird outlier 
but they are both ones that are like they occupy a lot of brain space for me and they've been very personally influential in my life um so yeah i you know i could make a separate list of like non-fiction books i love um but i thought this was a good mix uh, even if it's a little odd, you know, obviously, Sean, a lot of what I read is stuff for school that is like film theory and, and history mm -hmm. texts and stuff that would not apply for this at all, because even ones I really like, I don't, I just don't love them in that way, right? No one loves a textbook or an academic text in that way. There's a couple I've, I've come in contact with, but, but not to the degree that I would put them on a list like this. Um, but there is some stuff kind of more in that vein a little bit uh and then just a lot of stuff i like um so yeah i wasn't too strict with it i did i will say i briefly considered having alan moore's watchman on here even though it's a comic book i'm like it's it's enough of like a novelistic thing and it does occupy a certain level of my brain space in my life but there was like nothing else quite like it there were other things i kind of wanted to put on there so i kind of made a no comic books rule and and, you know, for myself. But other than that, you know, eh, that's kind of what I went with. Yeah. So I think mine is broadly fairly similar um, in that, like, I went for basically the widest possible um, definition. Uh, and so I, I don't have any nonfiction on my list, but that's more because I don't read a lot of nonfiction or, like, as you said, I don't, like, love it in the same way. I sort of vaguely considered maybe putting something by Foucault on there because he's definitely my favorite literary critic and theorist. Um, but there's just no, you know, it's like I really find his history of sexuality fascinating, but I don't, it's not like I have this like deep place in my heart for Michel Foucault's The History of Sexuality Volume 1 or something. Um, <laughs> but so like for me, it's just like, is it a, and in many ways it's like, is it a book or is it a work of literature? And I think work of literature is kind of more the broad definition um, that you could use probably for my list and that I did consider um short stories and poems and then ultimately i sort of segmented those out not th to make it easier for me so those are my sub lists is i have a short stories list and a poem list that's like a rough list of five short stories and five poems mostly because i think it is very difficult for an individual poem or an individual short story to compete with um like a full book style work um so i kind of segmented those off because there's some stuff i want to talk about that i just wouldn't be able to recognize and there is no world in this pod like there is no potential podcast in the future where we do the top 10 poems list like that's just never happening <laughs> so no. i'm like my, since that's never going to happen i might as well talk about my poems here um so i so i considered those um i did not exclude uh comic books slash graphic novels so that might feature somewhere on the list we will see but i considered those um fully and then as is kind of standard for these lists i also did not um duplicate anything for authors where there's only one author for whom that was like a particular i guess there are two authors for whom that was sort of a concern um and so we will get to that when we get to that um but yeah generally I, I sort of picked one work that is like the most representative of what i like about that specific author's stuff um and that was part of also how i put together my list yeah so i did the same thing with authors um, with comic books for me, I'll just say that's not because I consider comic books any lesser. It was just a purely a did it fit with the list thing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will also say the majority of comics I read are not American. They are Japanese and no Japanese comics are single volume works. That's just not a thing. Um, I mean, I'm sure there's a couple, but like manga. There, is, there are, uh, but yeah, like the, the most popular stuff is way longer right. running. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to put One Piece volume 57 or something on here. Um, you know, that'd be kind of weird. Uh, so yeah, so that's why I also, I don't know what your thoughts are on this. I considered putting a Shakespeare on here and that's a play and I just, it what didn't feel like the same kind of thing to me. Um, I don't know if you have different thoughts on that. We'll, we'll see maybe. We'll Who see. Knows? Okay. Maybe, Again, maybe, not maybe because we'll I see. consider it lesser. It just felt like enough of a different, th it was, this one was a really, Sean, I have to say a go with my gut list. Th this mm -hmm. was much less conscious. Like I want these kind of things and these kind of parameters it was i i listed out and honestly this was the fastest i've ever made a list i put out the the ones that were important to me it came out to like 11 or 12 and i trimmed it and ranked it and it was like it was just a very go with my gut shoot from the hip thing and i actually really like it because of that yeah i will say that honestly this list was not particularly hard for me to make partially because i had sort of already made it um it's one of the reasons why before like last week 
after we recorded last week's podcast, we talked off the air about like, what are we going to do for 350? And we had a couple of ideas of different things to do. And I kind of nudged us towards this one, partially because it was like, I don't have a lot of time to make a new list. And I basically had this list done. I just would have to like kind of touch it up and put stuff because I had made this list forever ago when we had originally said, oh, maybe eventually we'll do a top 10 books. I'm like, I should just put down some ideas for that right now while I'm thinking about it. Um, and I would say like one thing about my list and that like is very different from the video games list or the movies list. And I don't know that I suspect that maybe Jonathan, this is something similar to what you experienced when you put together your top 10 movies list is there is not nearly as much room for like sentimentality in how I put together the list because like at a certain point, there's like the stuff that's on my list and a lot of the stuff that's on my list, like the weight of it is so tremendous. Um, like to give an example of from my honorable mentions of um, like the kind of like fight I have to have in my head. So The Hobbit did not make my list. Um, that was one that I thought probably would because it is one of my favorite books. It is a book that like helped make me fall in love with reading. Um, but another thing that didn't make my list is uh, Paradise Lost by John Milton. And it was this thing of like, <laughs> could I ever, could I possibly sit here and make a list where I said that The Hobbit is better than Paradise Lost by John Milton? It was just like, I don't know if I could do that. Like, like there, there, it is more in a sentimental way. I have way more fondness for The Hobbit, but it's, but Paradise Lost is a text that stood for 400 years. It is one of the most influential texts in the English language. Like the way that we think about religion and religious symbolism and metaphor in Christianity in the West is completely changed by what Paradise Lost is. It is a massive epic poem composed by John Milton in his old age when he went blind. So the entire poem is composed him dictating it to an assistant. Um, and the entire thing is in strict rhyme and meter and it is perfect. And it's like, I can't, the weight of Paradise Lost is so tremendous that I couldn't possibly put The Hobbit above it. Um, and that was kind of how I have experienced a lot of this list was like the weight of a lot of these texts is so, so tremendous. That it was like, it kind of, like, like sentimentality definitely factored into like the placing on the list, but it sort of squeezed off some of the like, I really like Dune. Dune is a really fun book and I and it like helped make the like fall in love with sci-fi literature when I was in high school. But Dune is not better than Paradise Lost. There's no way I could possibly actually in like good faith make that kind of argument and talk about it on a podcast. It would feel utterly ridiculous to me. So that is also like a thing that factors into my list for sure in a way that is not at all true with the video games or the movie one where it's mostly just like, and eh, what I kind of like the best and that's just what I put on there. This one is like very, very hard for me to just do that. Well, and this is exactly what I was talking about earlier, Sean, of like kind of flipping the script because we, yeah, we've done that with movies and I definitely feel that in the way you're saying. Maybe not to the same degree because film does not have the same uh, age range of history as literature, you know? There is no 400-year-old mm -hmm. film. Um, but I definitely felt that. Like if you look at like my 2012 favorite films list versus my 2018, 2020 lists, and you'll just see like things that are sentimental favorites for me, like Back to the Future, obviously fall off in favor of The Passion of Joan of Arc. Will I will I watch The Passion of Joan of Arc as many times in my life as I will Back to the Future? No, but could I ever, in good faith, say you know Back to the Future is a better movie? Obviously not. Like like yeah, it's yeah. the same thing you're saying. And also for me, this is what I say though when I say when I made this list, I didn't have that sense of weight that you're talking about. I'm very proud of all the books on my list, and I love that I have these, and it's very representative of, I think, my identity, the 10 I have, but I didn't have to think about it that way, Sean. There was not a, um, you know, uh, that sense of weight. It's just like, these are the ones I, I love and, and treasure and, and value the most. Um, with one notable exception, here's one thing I have to talk about before we get into it. Okay. Harry Potter is not on my list. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't I know if it would have... Much. Sorry, what? I suspected as much. I don't know if it would have been either way. But there's a good chance it would have been because it would be a it would be a lie for me to get on here and talk about my favorite books and not be honest with the listeners that Harry Potter had a huge influence on me in just about every way. I it it there are patterns in how I write that I think come out of J.K. Rowling's prose. It occupied so much of my headspace through, you know, all the way through my early 20s, basically. Um, you know, huge, huge, huge thing for me. And in my heart, 
there is still a lot I really love about it. But I I just have to say the the wound of who J.K. Rowling has become in recent years and particularly recent months is just too raw for me to try to hold those books up to any of these other books that I also love and and loom large in my heart and my influence. And there would there would just be no way for me to figure that out right now. Maybe in ten years I can separate that more, but not right now. Um, and also, there's nothing else that's as new as that on here. You know, my a lot like half of my list is from the 1800s. So like, there's just there's also like a comparison thing that's tough. You know, mm -hmm. I have no fiction that's that recent. Um, so yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, like, for me, like, the closest thing I would have is that there's no... And that this would never have been on the list, but, like, not even in my honorable mentions, I don't have Speaker for the Dead, which is a novel by Orson Scott Card, the second Ender's Game novel, which I would stand by as, like, a fantastic science fiction novel um, that also it's like, it's, like, one of the most ironic novels of all time because it is so about... Um, it is, like, one of the best modern science fiction texts I've ever read that is entirely about, like, tolerance and understanding and trying to think, see things and see the world and understand the world from other perspectives to try to understand what the truth of the world is. Um, and for that to have been read, written by, like, someone who is an infamous homophobic bigot um, and that, like, actively and, like, passionately uses his platform to um, aggressively fight against the rights of gay people and trans people. It's like, it is so deeply ironic. I have no idea how Orson Scott Card can possibly be that person. But yeah, like that's not like I didn't even really think about those texts to put them on the even an honorable mentions list because it's like it's too too much for me to like think about. There are too many other like great books not written by motherfuckers that are still alive um, to even like worry about it. Cognitive dissonance is a hell of a drug. Yeah, uh, is what we've learned from some of our favorite authors. But we will celebrate better ones maybe today. Um, all right, so let's hear your sub lists, Sean, uh, uh, as I will just say as succinctly as possible because we have a lot to get through. Yeah, so um, first up, I want to just sort of drop a like the scope of what literature is is uh, incomprehensibly vast. It is not like um, movies where like you can be an individual and like reasonably be expected to have a decent understanding. Like, like grasp on the general scope of what movies entail because it's about 100 years um literature encompasses the entirety of human of like recorded human history so i want to like point out a couple of areas that are big like blind spots for me that I have like no personal experience with at all in case there are any like major literature nerds listening to this and being like why the fuck is this on, on here um and, or like why am i not even talking about it because I haven't read a lot of this stuff. So some stuff like any Russian literature, basically whatsoever, any of your like Dostoevsky's, um, Crime and Punishment, anything like that, um, Anna Karenina, haven't read them. Like it's not that I don't like them or that I think they're secretly bad or anything. And that's why none of that stuff's on this list. I just have never read it. I never took a class on it. So I was never particularly exposed to it. And they're very long and there's a lot of stuff to read. So like I know that those are some like the most acclaimed novels ever. Um, and I'm sure that they are extremely good. And I own a bunch of them and just have never gotten around to them. And I just have not gone around to them yet. Um, another big one is Ulysses by James Joyce. Um, this will probably maybe come up again somewhere in the list with a different Joyce text. Um, which I, Ulysses is a similar thing. I own it, have not gotten around to it. Um, that is a book that I really feel like if, if or probably when I go to get a master's degree, I will probably try to specifically find a class that does Ulysses because I need a class to help motivate me to get me through that text because it is very big and complex and it's a hard book to just read out of your own sort of like willpower without having other people to talk about it with. Um, the Indian classics like the, Mahabhar the Mahabharata, um, I have not read and those are ones that are on my list that I really want to read. Um, some of the Chinese classics like Journey to the West I also have not read um, and those are on my list of things I really want to get to. Um, there, I, Japanese literature is actually a pretty big blind spot for me. I've only read Japanese short stories. I've never read like a Japanese novel. And I'm not even saying like, I haven't read one translated into English. So any like Natsume Soseki, um, Ningen Shikaku by Osamu, Osamu Date, like a lot of those are ones I'm really interested in. Haven't gotten around to them. Um, so Japanese literature is with one exception, not featured on any of my list for today. And then also I, all of my interests in reading are like super old. So like stuff written in the past 60 to 70 years is just like, with one exception, I think there's only one thing on here that is um, a novel or a, like a modern work of literature that is written in that time period. 
Um, it's just like most of my interests skew way earlier. So it's like most of my focus is either on the modernist period around the early 20th century, or it's like the classics going back hundreds of years. So it's that's just my personal bias in like the stuff I like. But like if there is a novel that you're like, man, this is a really good novel, like Infant Jest or something like that. I just don't get around to that stuff. Um, it is why I can never talk to people who say they like books because it's like when most people like books, it's because they're reading books that like come out and most people are reading them and they have friends that talk about them. And it's like on the New York Times bestselling list. That's just not my personal relationship with literature. And it is like weird and isolating because it's like you just can't talk to people about the books they read because I'm like, I'm reading some weird fucking J.R.R. Tolkien translated or like made versions of ancient Norse poems and wrote them in modern English to have the same like alliterative poetic style. Nobody else is reading that bullshit that I know of. So uh, Sean here is referring to the legend of Sigurd and Gudrun um, that he previously mentioned on the podcast when we played God of War and he got really into Norse mythology. Yes. So that is the kind of person I am. So that's I just want to like put those disclaimers. I have nobody. Yeah. I have no idea who listens to these podcasts, but that's like where my focus is on literature so like if stuff's not on this list it's probably best because it, i'm not on it because i haven't read it not because i think it's bad or something i'm secretly yeah. shunning it from the list yeah i mean i i will say my favorite section of the bookstore whenever i go to like barnes and noble sean is the barnes and noble classic section where they mm -hmm. just sell because that's my favorite thing about barnes and noble i own a ton of these of the where they put out the nicest versions of like classic books that are in the public domain and some you would think public domain books it would be good to find easy to find good versions of and it's just not and so yeah. i often just go for the barnes and noble ones and they're cheap and i love them and i own a ton and there's ones like i have yet to get to like i have uh i have a i have like dracula here on my shelf i have the pilgrim's progress just some of these different ones uh i've been meaning to get war and peace because war and peace is one of the ones that i really really want to read at some point um I will say, if there was one big book that I have read a lot of and would be on my list if I felt comfortable saying I'd read the whole thing, that would be Journey to the West, the classic Chinese novel. I have read the first volume of the Anthony C. Yu translation, which is the big definitive English translation, but that is four volumes of about 500 pages apiece because that is a big boy of a novel, um, and I love it, but I have not read the whole thing, so I'm not going to sit here and be a, a poser on that. All right. So let's go ahead, I'll jump into, I've got a top five poems list, and then I have a top five short stories list. So my top five poems, um, my number five is Church Going by Philip Larkin. Um, this poem's probably best known for the first line of its final stanza, which is a serious house on serious earth it is. Um, a line taken by Grant Morrison for his Arkham Asylum graphic novel, which is a bad graphic novel. Um, and I'm annoyed that he took that <laughs> line from it. Um, so, but Church Going is, um, a poem that I, I really do think it captures something about my own relationship to religion in a modern context because it is very much about um, this sort of disbelief in religion itself, but then also in like the modern institutions of like the church and all of that. And yet also finding this like incredible like respect or some solemnity for the cultural institution, broadly speaking, of religion um, throughout history. And so it's all about this person who is not religious going to this church. Um, that's why that last stanza starts with that line, the sort of conclusion about what this place is that he's standing in and admiring like the art of this place, um, of, of this building, and he calls it a serious house on serious earth. Um, and it is something that like, there's something about that line that to me really captures this feeling I have if I visit like a cathedral when I'm in New York or something like that. And I, even though I'm not religious in any way, it like being in a, a massive, like St. Patrick's Cathedral or something like that, it hits me of, of like, this is one of the few places on earth that feels actually serious to me. Um, and there's something about that poem that really captures that feeling. My number four poem is For the Union Dead by Robert Lowell. Um, this is a fantastic poem um, that is a really brilliant meditation on the Civil War and like the legacy of the Civil War. Um, it, the whole poem is framed as uh, the narrator Robert Lowell being a child in an old Boston aquarium at the beginning. Um, and observing this sort of like very dreamlike imagery of the fish. And then it slowly transitions into um, this image of this pole or of this uh, statue uh, made for like commemorating the Union dead in the Civil War um, and what is happening around it in like a parking structure being built up around it and all this stuff and slowly moving forward towards modernity. Um, and then the poem ends with one of like the most killer fucking final stanzas in the history of modern poetry. 
um, which is again, it, so it starts with this image of the aquarium and the poem sets up the aquarium as being like this symbol of childhood and innocence. And so the final stanza is, the aquarium is gone. Everywhere giant finned cars nose forward like fish. A savage servility slides by on grease. Which is the best example of alliteration I have ever encountered in the English language. It is so fucking killer. That last stanza is so fucking killer. Um, and that f phrase, a savage servility slides by on grease, I think of a lot too as a like representation of um, like modern, like late capitalism effectively in our relationship towards like goods and commodities. Uh, my number three poem is Dulce et Decorum Est. It's a World War I poem by Wilfred Owen, um, a poet who tragically lost his life um, a few weeks before the ending of the war. Dulce et Decorum Est depicts a gas attack experienced by World War I soldiers um, and just has some very like sort of graphic, powerful language describing the effect that mustard gas has on the body and, and as it's killing these um, soldiers. And then it has um, the second half of the poem is effectively one extended stanza that starts talking about the relationship the soldiers have to the people back home that have sent them to this war and the sort of naivete of the people that sent them to this war ending with um, where the Latin line that the poem comes from, Dulce et decorum est perpetua mori, which basically means it is good and glorious to die for your fatherland. Um, which was a slogan used in World War One to motivate young men to join the army, um, and so he sort of recon like contextualizes that line and calls it the old lie. This lie repeated throughout history to get people to serve for a cause that serves nothing, um, and it's a very um, tragic but beautiful poem um, that is heightened by the fact that the poet died shortly after composing it. Um, my number two poem is "The Second Coming" by William Butler Yeats. Um, this poem is also very famous. It's probably both most well known for its four, first four lines where it starts uh, turning and turning in the widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconeer. Things fall apart. The sinner cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. Um, and the poem goes on to describe, um, and it, it was written around the same time as Dulce de Cormes. So it's very, it's a modernist poem shortly after World War One, um, describing the way that the perspective of people living in the world changed so massively by um, the events and sort of that sense of the loss of innocence, broadly speaking, of people existing in the world and the tremendous shared trauma of World War I um, that has that created effectively like an apocalyptic sensation that is in a lot of poetry from the period, similarly with um, T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Um, so the, the second half of The Second Coming describes in detail um, this beast being born out of the desert um, that is basically a sort of recontextualization of Jesus as the Antichrist, that Jesus is coming back for the second coming, but he's not coming to save anybody. Um, and it ends with another just like killer last two lines. Um, and what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. This is a poem that uh, when Donald Trump uh, got elected in 2016, I read this poem um, that night in 2016 of like, it made it like immediately made me think of this. Um, I was just like, "Yep, here's the rough beast <laughs> slouching towards us to be born." Fucking hell. Um, so very good poem. You can see that I really like that kind of like period of the early modernist poems because my number one poem, my favorite poem, is the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, um, which is T. S. Eliot. Um, I think T. S. Eliot's generally speaking, academia most highly regards the Wasteland as his best poem, and I like the Wasteland a lot. Um, there's something about J. Alfred Prufrock I just adore um, the language, the repetition of it. Um, it is a like pseudo narrative poem um, telling the just the life of this character, J. Alfred Prufrock, who is like the most like middle manager, balding, um, like midlife crisis um, kind of pathetic, uh, probably like thirty to forty year old man. Um, and it's just him sort of whiling away his life, kind of experiencing nothing, experiencing no joy, no socializing. And he just sort of watches life in the city pass him by. Um, it has a bunch of great lines in it, like the line, um, I'm measuring out my life in coffee spoons. Um, and then my favorite part of the poem is the ending, where it takes this very dreamlike turn. And at the end, it begins to describe uh, Prufrock as he's sort of seeing this vision of almost like a mermaid. Um, and this like beautiful description of the ocean um, as it sort of takes him over um, and it ends with a line uh, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. 
Um, and it's just got this weird, strange, sort of surrealist ending um, that is very cool, and I like it a lot. It's a great poem. It's my favorite poem. I read a lot. It's very good. Sean, if you love T.S. Eliot so much, why will you not do an episode on Cats with me? Because all the songs in Cats yeah. are based on T.S. Eliot poems. There is no greater insult to the legacy of T.S. Eliot than Cats. <laughs> I mean, that is undoubtedly true, but, yeah. um, you know. <laughs> you know, because, like, you know, the Cats poems, like, I love T.S. Eliot's work. Like, the Cats poems are children's poems. Like, it's, you know, right. they're cool, but it's not. Like, they they were, like, written for him, by him for his, like, nephew or something. Um, so it's just not exactly my thing. You're not into horny cats gyrating and singing uh, T.S. Eliot's children's poems? No, yeah, I'm just like, it's just not quite my fetish. If that's what you're into, that's cool. I'm not going to kink shame, but it's just like not for me. Um, I like your poems, Sean. They are appropriately dour and heavy. Oh, yeah, um, yeah that, that is definitely, I definitely go towards that kind of poetry. Um, I don't know, there's something about poetry that it, it needs to be dark for it to like really grab my attention, I feel. Nice. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to my top five short stories. Um, number five, this is a great Halloween short story. It's The Yellow Wallpaper by Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Um, this is such a great short story. It is about a woman. Um, it's like late Victorian period. Um, and it's about her being diagnosed as being a hysteric. Um, and so she is sort of basically locked away in the attic for a resting cure, um, which was a real thing that um, happened to women where they would like their husbands and a physician would just decide, well, you're just crazy. And we because you're just a lady and women are just crazy. And the only way to cure you is to basically lock you in a room and remove anything that could possibly disturb your um, fragile constitution. Uh, and it turns out if you lock someone into solitary, it kind of fucks up their head a little bit. So if they weren't crazy going in, which they usually weren't, they were kind of crazy coming out of it. Um, so it basically is the story of this woman who is locked in this room. Um, and the room has this sort of like gross kind of moldy peeling yellow wallpaper. Um, and over the course of the story, the, the protagonist and narrator starts to hallucinate that she sees this sort of like spectral figure of a woman behind the yellow wallpaper trying to get out um and and it's sort of her hallucinations escalate over the course of the story to where then she's like looking out a window and she thinks she sees the same figure leaning and like pe peering at her from behind a tree out her window it's incredibly creepy um it's very effective um it's got like a really like creepy fucked up ending um it's a great short story i would highly recommend it's and it is a truly short story it's like six or eight pages um i would highly recommend people it's read it you can just find it for free online it's very, very good. Uh, my number four, I don't know if I'd call this a short story, but I didn't find, I couldn't figure out anywhere else to like talk about it. So I was like, oh, it's a short piece of effectively fiction. So I might as well put it here. Um, it is A Modest Proposal by Jonathan Swift, the sort of classic piece of English language satire um, that if people took AP literature, you have definitely read A Modest Proposal because it's been ta um, taught in AP literature in English or American high schools for decades at this point. Um, and for good reason, because it is like the best piece of satire I've ever seen. Like if you have not read it as an adult person, you should read it because it is like shockingly powerful. Um, for people who don't know what a modest proposal is, it is a piece of satire um, written at a time where, um, you know, tensions between the British and the Irish who were colonized by the British at this point in time, this is 17th century. Um, those tensions were at a peak um, and the Irish were being abused and... Um, you know, this is around the time of the potato famine and stuff like that. And so the story of, not really a story, but this sort of essay of a modest proposal proposes that what the English should do to solve this problem of their relationships with Ireland is to buy Irish babies and eat them for food because it solves all the, our problems about hunger for the poor. Um, and then it also gives money and it's a new revenue source for the impoverished Irish. Um, and it, it is like this incredibly like straight faced, like detailed plan about how you would implement this and all the benefits of eating children. Um, and it is like ghoulish and ghastly. It is fucking hilarious. And it is also just incredibly sharp um, in how it is. It, it, it's sharp both for its political period at the time. But I think it's like broadly applicable for any scenario where you have a majority population that is exploiting and um oppressing a minority population that is also like heavily impoverished so it is if you read it today there's like a lot of parallels you can take to modern society in america 
Um, and you gotta give Jonathan Swift his due. The dude was very fucking good at what he wrote. My number three short story is Story of an Hour by Kate Chopin. This is another one I would really recommend people read because it is very short. It's the shortest uh, story of these short stories. Story of an Hour is one of my the, like the best feminist short stories I've ever read. It's late Victorian period, 1890s. Um, and it's just the story of this um, wife who hears that her husband has been killed. And it is basically like a, a two pages of her reaction to this. Um, that then has a big twist ending. And it is just this like utter visceral, just like brutal skewering of the institution of marriage and the effect that the institution of marriage has on the psychology of women, um, both at the time. And I think it can be also again taken to as like effective commentary for gender um, in society today. It is so good. Like it's so good that even though it's been out for over a hundred years, um, I, and you can just get it for free. I don't want to actually spoil the ending because the ending is so good. Um, and it's one that I've taught this a couple of times because it is a really good 10 honors um, short story because you can very quickly see as people start to comprehend what the story is trying to do and then they get the ending and you can just see it ripple throughout the class as they're reading the story and it's like, oh shit, this is what the story is doing. Like, this is what it's about. It's so like sort of unassuming early on and then it keeps on surprising you and it's just like very clever um, how it's constructed. My number two short story, um, this is by far the most obscure thing on any of these lists. Um, this is a thing that is only published in two English language uh, anthologies that I know of. I own one of them. Um, it's Suisen or Narcissus, depending on which verb, like translated version you uh, find of it is. It is a Japanese short story written by Hayashi Fumiko, um, who's a great female Japanese sort of feminist author from the mid 20th century. It is a post-World War II story um, that is about a single mother trying to raise her son. And it's just a character study of this single mother. And it is, um, she is like just this deeply fascinating character that you get this full portrait of over the course of the story and her like strange sort of neuroses about her relationship with her son and this sort of friction and contradiction in her relationship with her son where she both kind of despises her son for what he has kind of forced her life to become. That's like, well, I can't go and be the person I want to be because I have to be here taking care of you. Um, while also at the same time she like so deeply loves him um, and it is this like really powerful story about this sort of like the two sides of love and hate in familial bonds um, that is also just like very dark um, but uses that sort of the setting of post-war Japan incredibly effectively. Um, it is very hard to find like you can't even find a pdf on it of it online I've tried and it's just like not there. So I don't know if unless you want to buy an anthology of feminist Japanese short stories, you're not going to be able to get it or, and read it. But if you do, it's very, very good. Um, and then my number one short story. Uh, I love this story so much. Like this is kind of the reason why I ended up doing a short stories list is because I really wanted to put this on my top 10. And I just couldn't quite find room for it for a couple of reasons um, is Bartleby the Scrivener by Herman Melville. This short story is so unbelievably good. It is fucking incredible. Bartleby the Scrivener is about Bartleby, who is a scrivener, which is basically a clerk at a law office who his job is to um, transcribe and write copies of, of legal documents. Because this is obviously back before you had um, like broad access to printing press for like a private firm and stuff like that. So it's just like you got to have people sitting there writing out um, copies by hand of a lot of these legal documents. Um, and the whole story is told from the perspective of the sort of chief or like the boss of this small, literally small legal firm that has like five employees. And it starts with him hiring Bartleby. And early on, Bartleby seems a little bit strange, but not anything that peculiar. And he hires him. Um, and then over the course of the story, Bartleby just becomes more and more bizarre as he every time he is asked to do something, he responds towards any request with, I would prefer not to. Um, and when he says, I would prefer not to, the person asking him, usually the, the narrator um, for whatever this thing is, just like kind of backs off. Um, and as the novel goes on, Bartleby's behavior becomes more bizarre, more eccentric um, to the point where he's basically refusing to do anything. He's just living in this building um, and nobody can kind of do anything against him because of the power of, um, as the narrator says, the power of this ne this bizarre statement of the negative preference, which is like this utter like linguistic and rhetorical non-entity that is like it is a preference towards nothing, which is not something you can argue against because it is not a forceful no, um, but it also is no way to get him to acquiesce to anything. 
Uh, it is a really brilliant short story that in proper Herman Melville fashion is like incredibly funny. It is raucously funny, I find, um, while also being incredibly like having these elements of darkness and tragedy as well. Um, it has a fairly dark ending um, for Bartleby because the story is about kind of twofold. It is about the ways in which like simple non-compliance jams up the like social contract in the gears of modern society and someone just saying no i don't want to do that just causes everything to stop um, because you just expect people to comply when you ask them to do something when you are a boss and so it is a lot about that it is also a lot about how then society will take any sort of eccentric eccentric elements or eccentric individuals and it will slowly, through the force of state violence, squeeze those people out of society because it's not useful and is obstructing. Um, so the ways in which he obstructs is very funny. And then ultimately society's response to him is incredibly tragic. Um, but I think about Bartleby the Scrivener all the time. I think it is just like a, one of the most brilliant texts about like modern society, even though it's about like 160, 170 years old. It is still, I think, so perfectly applicable to the world we live in today. Um, and if you have not read Bartleby the Scrivener, it comes with the highest possible recommendation. Sean, I love these lists. This is so cool. I mean, I've heard of some of these. Um, I know Bartleby the Scrivener. I know A Modest Proposal. I know Second Coming, if I'm looking at some of these. But there's a lot that I want to go find. And because this is all short, I can do it easily. Yes. Um, and I've been, I've just been taking notes on what you've been saying because this is, this is cool stuff. Um, uh, also, just a very dark set of lists. If your main list is this dark, we're all going to be fucking crying by the end of this podcast, Sean. <laughs> you know, there's some there's some lighter elements in my list, but there's you know I like hey, if you've read any of my other like listened to any of my other lists, you know that I like some dark shit. Yeah, I mean, you guys don't ever see Sean, so you don't know that he is just a full on goth. Um, there are just black <laughs> curtains throughout his room where we record. Um, your hair is dyed black. You have like white Johnny Depp face paint on. It's uh, yeah, it's I've got heavy. I've got mascara um, and black eye makeup on. Um, it's pretty yeah. intense. I it also is. wear a cape at all times. This is not connected to the goth thing. I just like capes. <laughs> all right. Well, do you want to go ahead and move on to our 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 main event, the top ten books? Yes. Do you, do you right. have any honorable mentions or anything else that you want to go through before we do the list? I don't. Um, I think they will. I think I do have some that will come up in the natural course of talking about the texts on the lists. Okay. Um, yes. So why don't I start? Because you just talked for a while and probably need a little break. Um, yes. And then and then this will also help give you the final word on this, which I think is, is the right way to order this one. So... Uh, my number 10 is one of the more different ones on my list. It's one of the ones that is not fiction, um, and it's it's not a traditional nonfiction either. This is a book by Rebecca Solnit, who is a phenomenal author, called A Field Guide to Getting Lost. It is from 2005, and if you, don't, if you aren't familiar with the works of Rebecca Solnit, she is a really fascinating author who doesn't really write like anyone else, because she is... She has the knowledge of an academic in terms of how much she just has collected and synthesized in the world, but she does not write like an academic, and she does not write in the way academics do, which is for this closed loop circle of other academics and like collegiate settings, you know? Um, what she writes are these very like poetic, um, warm, empathetic, I think empathetic is the main word I would use with her, essays and essay-length books, or book-length essays, um, about kind of broad topics that she turns into something very specific. And a field guide to getting lost, even in Solnit's larger body of work, is one of the harder ones to describe. So I will just read to you the back of the cover definition of it here really quick because i think it's mm -hmm. an interesting way to get started with this because how do they sell this because this is kind of funny if you go on amazon I, I was looking this up the other day the reviews for this book on amazon are really funny because it's a lot of people who like got this for a book club and were really mad at it because it is so non-traditional 
Um, but the way they sell it is they say, written as a series of autobiographical essays, a field guide to getting lost draws on emblematic moments and relationships in Rebecca Solnit's life to explore issues of uncertainty, trust, loss, memory, desire, and place. Solnit is interested in the stories we use to navigate our way through the world and the places we traverse from wilderness to cities in finding ourselves or losing ourselves. While deeply personal, her own stories link up to larger stories from captivity narratives of early Americans to the use of the color blue in Renaissance painting, not to mention encounters with tortoises, monks, punk rockers, mountains, deserts, and the movie Vertigo. The result is a distinctive, simulating voyage of discovery. And I think that's actually a pretty good description in terms of it gives you a sense of all the different things she is drawing upon, because in a single chapter, she will go from Renaissance painting to an ancient historical story to somebody she met and is telling their story to a movie that sparks her interest. And it is very kind of ordered stream of consciousness in this way. And I really, I love her work, but this is the one that's always hit me hardest. Um, it is one that I used heavily in my master's thesis, which was called Elegy for a Lost Tomorrow. And it was about um, the works of Isao Takahata, the filmmaker who made Grave of the Fireflies and Kaguya-hime and things like that. And and that's a very personal work I did. It's it's my it's the thing I am proudest of ever writing and I, I hope I can get back to that place. Um, because I think Solnit, the way she writes and and not just like analyzing a thing or giving you a history or one of these things, but really synthesizing history and analysis into something more personal and emotive is something that I really strive to do in my work and I think is like a platonic ideal of the kind of thing I would like to do. Um, a Field Guide to Getting Lost is specifically about the sensation of being lost, of wandering, of not knowing where you're going um, in geography, but also just in life, in art, in, in questioning things, in learning. It is a beautiful uh, tome about these things. Um, you know, I'll, I'll read one. I have a couple of passages here, but one just to share this this feeling is, she says, um, certainly for artists of all stripes, the unknown, the idea or the form or the tale that has not yet arrived is what must be found. It is the job of artists to open doors and invite in prophecies, the unknown, the unfamiliar. It's where their work comes from, although its arrival signals the beginning of the long disciplined process of making it their own. So she says things like this. Um... It is a book full of lessons and meditations, and it is one that just lives pretty close to my heart. I, I reference it a lot. I use it a lot. Um, Solnit is someone who actually has, I think, more of a cultural footprint than people would know because they might not even know her name, but they might know some of her contributions to culture. Uh, she is, for instance, the person who coined the term mansplaining. Um, from her early 2000s essay, Men Explain Things to Me, which if you have never read is just a, a great essay. Like it would be, if I were doing my short stories list, Sean, it would be in the place where like your Jonathan Swift was, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Men Explain Things to Me is very smart. It is basically about Solnit being at a party and a man, a fellow, like an academic man, explaining to her this amazing book he had read or heard about and her realizing she's t he's talking about my book and then she tries to say, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I wrote it, and he refuses to believe her. And that's that's where mansplaining comes from. Um, but A Field Guide to Getting Lost is, is I think, I have not read all her books. I've read several of them. Um, there's one, oh, I forget the name of it, but it's it's about some of the Moy Bridge photographs and like early film. Uh, the Far Away Nearby is what that one's called. And and that one is used in film studies a lot. Um, she works with film into her, her works quite a bit, so her stuff is kind of popular with film people. I'll just read one more passage before I, I, I throw it back to you, Sean. Um, but there's this thing late in A Field Guide to Getting Lost that she says about movies, and it is something I think about a lot and is one of my favorite quotes ever written about cinema, but it is not about cinema at the same time. She says, Movies are made out of darkness as well as light. It is the surpassingly brief intervals of darkness between each luminous still image that make it possible to assemble the many images into one moving picture. Without that darkness, there would only be a blur, which is to say that a full-length movie consists of half an hour or an hour of pure darkness that goes unseen. If you could add up all the darkness, you would find the audience in the theater gazing together at a deep imaginative night. It is the terra incognita of film, the dark continent on every map, 
In a similar way, a runner's every step is a leap so that for a moment he or she is entirely off the ground. For those brief instants, shadows no longer spill out from their feet like leaks, but hover below them like doubles as they do with birds, whose shadows crawl below them, caressing the surface of the earth, growing and shrinking as their makers move nearer or farther from that surface. For my friends who run long distances, these tiny fragments of levitation add up to something considerable. By their own power, they hover above the earth for many minutes, perhaps some significant portion of an hour, or perhaps far more for the hundred-mile races. We fly, we dream in darkness, we devour heaven in bites too small to be measured. And there is just a lot of stuff like this in Solnit's work, but I think my favorite concentrated burst of it is this book. Uh, it is so different from everything else. I think that's it's also the newest thing on this list. So that is why uh, it comes in at 10, but I love it quite deeply. Awesome. Yeah, like you were 100% right that I had not, like I would never been able to recognize her name, but I've like read some of her work, including that essay about mansplaining, um, which is very good. Yes. All right. So, Sean, your number 10. All right. My number 10 is Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, written in 1899. Um, for people who, because I, I imagine most people have at least heard of Heart of Darkness, maybe if you haven't actually read it, um, but it is about a um, sailor named Marlowe, um, who at the beginning of the novel relates to these other men, who is like friends who are with him on this kind of like boating journey. Um, he tells them the story of when he went to the Congo, um, when it was colonized and enslaved and using slave labor to um, get ivory. Um, and his boat, his journey down this river into the heart of darkness in the Congo um, to try to find a man named Mr. Kurtz, who was the company's um, the top man, basically the man getting the most ivory, but also who had gone off the, the deep end um, and has basically created this sort of like strange society deep within the jungle um, where he is sending all this ivory back, but there's something wrong with him. Um, it's maybe both best well known today as being the source material for uh, Apocalypse Now, which is a fantastic movie. Um, although I do think that Heart of Darkness as a book is better than Apocalypse Now, though Apocalypse Now is quite good. Um, Heart of Darkness is fascinating because it is um, it has something that like I tend to really gravitate gravitate towards in literature, which is this sort of internal friction um, where the author Conrad clearly like is for his day like intensely radically progressive um, in the way he's addressing and sort of interrogating these issues. Um, and his perspective on what colonialism and imperialism is, is pretty radical for 1899, um, which is, you know, you're still basically at the height of that period of colonialism that ends with World War I, because like one of the things that creates the, like, the pressure for World War I to eventually happen is all these different European nations going and um, colonizing the rest of the world for resources. Um, and so it is like an intentionally, an intensely like powerful and aggressive novel in sort of its political agenda. And at the same time, it is a racist book. Like there's no way to read it and not come to the conclusion um, that Conrad it still holds like racist assumptions and racist biases against the people of the Congo. And he is so aloof and like distant from them. Um, but is the thing that makes the novel or the novella, because it's rather, rather short, like so effective is that friction where it feels like it's Conrad pushing up the against the boundaries of what he can do and like what he can kind of think of in trying to um, interrogate and dissect this issue of colonialism that he lives in. Um, and it's just an incredibly powerful uh, novel that I think serves as sort of like a lot of the foundation of what becomes the movement of post-colonialism in literature that sort of builds out of Heart of Darkness, both by taking the things that Heart of Darkness does well and trying to build from them, and then also looking at the areas where Heart of Darkness falls short. Um, most notably is actually, um, it is a fairly sexist book, um, although it, it is fairly sexist, and it's like, especially like Marlowe is a fairly sexist character, but at the same time, the novel gives you enough distance from it to allow the reader, I think, to engage more critically with those issues, which is always what um, I'm looking for. Like, these are some ideas that we definitely talk about with um, in Weekly Suit Gundam about Gundam, because this is another thing that I find about Tomino as a creator, that even when he has things that we would say in the modern parlance are problematic, 
the the creator is if the creator is always struggling against those elements in trying to be self-critical and trying to self-evolve which is what i find in conrad as an author um it makes for like an incredibly powerful work of fiction that i think allows you to grow by seeing the author at friction with themselves um for the passage i want to read um this is a section i think about from this novel all the time uh, because i think it is where you get the sense of conrad is looking at this stuff from a very different perspective um because conrad himself was polish um but he wrote mostly english language literature he lived a lot of his life in england um and he wrote his literature for the english market more or less um and that i think gives in some ways this novel its perspective in it being able to be sort of a somewhat critical of the british empire as an institution because conrad himself was not natively um british or english and so he's able to look at it a little bit from the outside it allows him to write this passage near the beginning of the novel before you get marlowe relating his adventure that everyone thinks of of what heart of darkness is and um, it's in this sort of like boating party that he's at with his buddies. Um, and it's like they have done this sort of like overnight um, voyage through the River Thames. And they're waking up in the morning and they're all talking to each other and like looking out as like, like dawn is breaking over the horizon. Um, and they're all sort of like silent for this moment as um, the brooding gloom of sunshine glares under the stars, as he says. Um, and then Marlowe says just out of nowhere says this thing. And this also, said Marlowe suddenly, has been one of the dark places of the earth. I was thinking of very old times, when the Romans first came here 1900 years ago, the other day. Light came out of this river since. You say nights? Yes. But it is like running blaze on a plain, like a flash of lightning in the clouds. We live in the flicker. May it last as long as the old earth keeps rolling. But darkness was here yesterday. Imagine the feelings of a commander of a fine, what do you call him, trireme in the Mediterranean, ordered suddenly to the north, run over land across the Gauls in a hurry, put in charge of one of these craft, the legionnaires, a wonderful lot of handy men they must have been too, used to build apparently by the hundred in a month or two, if we may believe what we have read. Imagine him here, the very end of the world, a sea the color of lead, a sky the color of smoke, a kind of ship about as rigid as a concertina and going up this river with stores or orders or what you like. Sandbanks, marshes, forests, savages. Precious little to eat for a civilized man, nothing but Thames water to drink. No Falernian wine here, no going ashore. Here and there a military camp lost in a wilderness, like a needle in a bundle of hay. Cold, fog, tempests, disease, exile, and death. Death skulking in the air, in the water, in the bush. They must have been dying like flies here. Oh yes, he did it. Did it very well too, no doubt, and without thinking much about it either, except afterwards to brag of what he had gone through in his time, perhaps. They were men enough to face the darkness, and perhaps he was cheered by keeping his eye on a chance of promotion to the fleet of, at Ravenna by and by, if he had good friends in Rome and survived the awful climate. Or think of a decent young citizen in a toga, perhaps too much dice, you know. Coming out there here in the train of some prefect or tax gatherer, gatherer or trader even to mend his fortunes. Land in a swamp, march through the woods, and in some inland post feel the savagery, the utter savagery, had closed round him. All that mysterious life of the wilderness that stirs in the forest, in the jungles, in the hearts of wild men. There's no initiation either into such mysteries. He has to live in the midst of the incomprehensible, which is also detestable. And it has a fascination, too, that goes to work upon him. The fascination of the abomination. You know, imagine the growing regrets, the longing to escape, the powerless disgust, the surrender, the hate. And so that passage describing Britain the way that in 30 pages from that point, he's going to start describing the Congo. Um, because, again, this is after Marlowe has been on this, this adventure. So this is him setting up what he's going to um, talk about. And this sort of historical perspective that Conrad adopts that was pretty rare um, in the period in, like, contemporary literature that, like, is really going to town, like, saying we are doing the same things to these places that was done to our ancestors, the Anglo-Saxons, by the Romans like 2000 years ago like like he's he's adopting this historical perspective of this cycle he's seeing of colonialism and imperialism and saying the things that we acknowledge as like civilization are 
are temporary and are not these sort of like permanent achievements that we have gained but is like a flicker of light in the darkness and this is this like brilliant empire we think of of this empire where the sun never sets on the british empire it is one brief glimmer in an infinite darkness of time that we live in and it is not this eternal shining sea um and i think that as setting up and like bringing in and forefronting for the audience this idea this is talking about friction of it gives the audience space that then when conrad you can see him not being able to fully um sort of identify and fully sympathize with the natives of the congo because because he was a white dude in 1899 um writing this it gives you this space to recognize the failings of the author's perspective because he's trying to push against those boundaries and is giving you the room to have now that we are reading this in 2020 to have the further additional hundred years of historical perspective that allows us to take that rhetorical argument he's making about what civilization and quote unquote savagery is that next step further um, and that to me is what makes heart of darkness one of the definitive texts on colonialism um, in the 20th century yeah, uh, Heart of Darkness. So I've read this one. I read it in high school, probably yes. same time you did for the first yes, time. We definitely, we um, were in the same class when you read it. This is, in fact, I believe this is the copy I had um, in high school that I read. From. Yeah, nice. I've got a couple of different versions of this. Yeah, um, and it it left an impression on me, and it's one I need to read again as an adult because I know, like, mm -hmm. there are. I think about this a lot. I think there are a lot of books we waste on high schoolers <laughs> because, like, they're just like I just I know books that like bounced the fuck off of me as a kid that I should go revisit because I know they're brilliant and like something sparks 10 years later from my memory and Heart of Darkness is one I think about a lot um but I do at some point need to revisit as an adult um and yeah I mean because I I'm sure as a 17 year old I did not that passage probably didn't hit me like it did just now you reading it you know Oh, yeah. No, this is like definitely like the revelation of being an English teacher in high school is like being forced to reread all the stuff you read in high school and be, as an adult and be like, oh, shit. Turns out um, Great Gatsby, which is not on my list, but I guess that would be an honorable mention because it is very good. Great Gatsby is a fucking incredible book. Like what a great oh, it's novel so good. that is. Yeah. Um, that, you know, when you like I don't blame high schools for high schoolers for not liking it. But also at the same time, there's a part of me that's like, we, well, we have to keep on teaching it because if we don't. Are they going to keep on fucking reading it? Like, we got to keep it alive because it's so good. Right. Um, and, and there are just, like, you do see it. Um, there are those handful of students that it does, like, grasp and they do kind of, like, embrace it. Um, but, yes, yeah. it is one of those frustrating things about, it's like, if you're not liking it now, trust me, if you read this book again in, like, 20 years, you're going to, like, see a whole other side of what it's doing and it's going to blow your fucking mind. But none of them would believe me if I told them that. What, what do you think, and you can take a mulligan on this if it's on your list later, what's the book in high school that actually hit you the hardest at the time, do you think? Um, like, when you were when you were a student? Um, I would say that it is um, on my list. Um, okay. I, I have two. I have one that we read in school that is later on my list, and I have one that I read at that time in my life that was not for school um, that is yeah. also on my list. Um, but I would say, I think Heart of Darkness probably would be the one that I haven't talked about yet on the list that, like, is um that it, that it did it hit me pretty hard because like because that passage i read like that was i remember very vividly being in um mr c's class i'm not going to like give his name away but it's you know who yes. i'm talking about john because we were in the I same do. class um and reading that and him pointing out that passage and it did like give me a very different perspective on things that i when i had read it on my own i was like oh, what is this I don't, know, I don't know it's just words um and i hadn't really thought about it and then like paying more attention to it being like oh shit like this is actually very fascinating um this perspective he's taking in that when you're a teenager in particular it is very very difficult to step back from the historical moment in which you're living and try to see the world from a broader point of view um it's one of like the things that like yeah. the benefits of education is like we try to like force people to do that and like get into that mode of self-reflection and stepping out of where you are right now and thinking about a historical perspective um, and, and that passage from Heart of Darkness is one that I remember very vividly doing to me in high school. Yeah, I, um, I was going to say, there, so there's one for me that is related to something later on, and I'll talk about that. But the one that definitely viscerally hit me the hardest at the time, and I think if I reread it now, might even make my top 10 books list, I just haven't read it recently enough, was Catch-22. That's the one that I remember yeah. getting the most as a kid and being like, I, it was the one that I was like most engaged with as a teenager of the ones like they gave us for class, you know?
Yeah, no, Catch-22 is brilliant. If, like, if we did a just, like, ranking of, like, funniest novels, Catch-22 might be <laughs> the funniest novel I've ever read. Like, I've read oh, a bunch it's... of very funny stuff like Hitchhikers, but Catch-22 is just ridiculously funny. Screamingly funny, and, and it's funny when you're the kid reading it in high school, and I bet it's even funnier as an adult when you would mm-hmm. actually understand half of what it's talking about. Um, yeah. Yes. All right. So that was your number 10. So should I do my number 10? Or nine? <laughs> your number nine is. If, I mean, if you want to talk about your number ten again, I'm not going to stop you. Yeah, this is luckily this is not a math list. Um, okay, my number nine is a book that I love on its own phenomenally. It is also here standing in for a whole bunch of uh, books and stories, and that is Arthur Conan Doyle's The Hound of the Baskervilles, mm-hmm. uh, the Sherlock Holmes novel, the best Sherlock Holmes story. Uh, and I know that is like a basic choice. But there is a reason Hound of the Baskervilles is the iconic Sherlock Holmes story, and it's because it just, it is, it's the best one. Like, it's it's so good. It is so perfectly constructed. It is so exciting and scary and kind of weird. Um, and, and also fairly different because it has this, like, epistolary form in a lot of it. Uh, Sherlock Holmes is not in most of the book, which I think people always forget with this one. And it makes it one of the harder ones to adapt when I've seen different adaptations. Because mm-hmm. he's just gone for most of the book and then he comes in at the end. Um, so it's mostly a Watson story, kind of seeing other things. But I just love it to death. I, re- I you know, I read this one. Definitely, it was the first Sherlock Holmes anything I read as a kid, and then I probably read it again in high school to, during my Sherlock Holmes phase. I have my Barnes and Noble giant Sherlock Holmes. This is just you know half of it, the volume one, which is what uh, Hounds of the Baskervilles is in. Um, and I know I, I'd read it in here, and then a couple years ago I read it again as an adult just for fun. And I was astonished by like even roughly knowing the contours of the story and all of that. Um, by how involved I was in it. It's a short book. It's 150 pages or so. Um, But, like, it just pulls you through. It's got this great gothic horror atmosphere. It's one of the Sherlock Holmes stories that is, like, genuinely kind of, like, frightening in places. It has just atmosphere that you could cut with a knife. And I think all of that comes together in... My passage, which again is basic, but I, if I'm going to read a passage from The Hound of the Baskervilles, I'm going to read the end of chapter one. So mm-hmm. let me go really quick here. This is when Dr. Mortimer, who brings the case to Holmes, is telling him about the death of Sir Charles um, at the Barrymore Estate. So here we go. Or, uh, not of the Barrymore Estate, the book Baskerville Estate. So he says, I checked and corroborated all the facts which were mentioned at the inquest. I followed the footsteps down the yew alley. I saw the spot at the moor gate where he seemed to have waited. I remarked the change in the shape of the prince after that point. I noted that there were no other footsteps save those of Berrymore on the soft gravel. And finally, I carefully examined the body, which had not been touched until my arrival. Sir Charles lay on his face, his arms out, his fingers dug into the ground, and his features convulsed with some strong emotion to such an extent that I could hardly have sworn to his identity. There was certainly no physical injury of any kind, but one fall statement was made by Barrymore at the inquest. He said that there were no traces upon the ground round the body. He did not observe any, but I did, some little distance off, but fresh and clear. Footprints? Footprints. A man or a woman's? Dr. Mortimer looked strangely at us for an instant, and his voice sank almost to a whisper as he answered, Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. It's so good! It's Mm -hmm. so fucking good! And like, you know, so this, The Hound of the Baskervilles is one of several things I'm sure both of us have that was published serialized um, mm-hmm. in the Strand magazine. So it was published over a series of months. And of course, that was the end of chapter one. And you can just tell, a hundred. this book is from 1902. This would have been published originally in 1901. Um, 120 years later, you can tell why this created a run on the magazine stands when chapter two came out and like the biggest sellout of the Strand magazine ever. Um because it is just that good. You know, the context for this one is this is the first thing he wrote after killing off Holmes. So he does the final problem. Holmes goes over the Reichenbach Falls with, with Moriarty and he dies. And then Arthur Conan Doyle stepped away and didn't write Sherlock Holmes for eight years. And then he had the inspiration to do this as just completely a one-off. The plan was not to bring Holmes back. This is set earlier in the timeline before Holmes dies. Um, so it, it was just a one-off, like, I want to write some Sherlock Holmes. And it really 
really does feel maybe the most energized Doyle ever was writing these stories of just the sheer level of like creativity and craft. And I love that about it. It, it was something that came out of just love for the art. Um, and then, of course, after this was big, then you get um, the empty hearse where where Holmes comes back or what is it? empty house? Sorry, empty house. Yeah. Yeah, Empty House, where, where Holmes comes back, which is great. And then I think the second half of the Holmes stories are more uneven than the first half, but there's mm-hmm. a lot of good ones in there, obviously. Um, but yeah, uh, Hound of the Baskervilles, if I'm picking one to stand in for my love of Holmes, which I do love Holmes. Um, I At some point, I lost my Barnes & Noble you know, copies of these, and so I bought new ones because it's like I have to have these on hand just in case I want to bust open and read a Sherlock Holmes story because it's a fun thing to do. Uh, and Hound of the Baskervilles is my favorite one. Awesome, yeah. There's no homes on my list, but it is. I deeply love those stories. Like of of detective fiction, like I still Holmes is my favorite. Like I just think Doyle, I mean, just nailed it perfectly. Um, if I had to, if I had to pick one of the novellas, like Baskervilles is definitely the best novella. I think my favorite story is probably just the Adventure of the Speckled Band. I think is like the most pure, tightest, like n- normal home story, right? Because Baskervilles is basically like the equivalent of like the Sherlock Holmes movie. If I had to right. pick like an episode of the hypothetical Sherlock Holmes TV show, that's what Speckled Band is. It's just a brilliant twist. It's just very, very good. But like most home stuff is amazing. Uh, Baskervilles is fantastic. And if you want some just like really just like luscious fucking cutting descriptions of the Moors, yes. that's what you want from Baskervilles. If you just want to read the word Moor um, like 500 times, Hand of the Baskervilles gives you just Moor. The Moor. It's- Oh, it's so good. I mean, seriously, guys, this is this is eleven dollars at Barnes and Noble, and it will keep you busy forever. Everyone should own these; they're so good. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah, don't underestimate the home stuff. It's like just because it's like the originator of that kind of genre does not mean that it's like it gets improved upon. It's like it is sometimes the original is still the best. Yep. All right, your number nine. All right, my number nine, which is the biggest outlier on my list, is the most modern text. It is the only one that is not um, what you would, I guess, traditionally just call a book on its own, is The Complete Mouse by Art Spiegelman, which is a graphic novel, um, which was published in a serialized form between 1980 and 1991, um, and then released in two separate volumes, basically at the halfway point, volume one came out. Um, and then in 1991, when it was all assembled together, Volume 2 was released. And then now, if you buy it, you would just get it as what I have, um, which is the complete mouse. Um, this mouse spelled M-A-U-S, uh, not just normally. So Mouse by Art Spiegelman is, I think, if I had to pick one, just like what is like legitimately the best comic book ever written, I think Mouse would be what I'd pick, obviously, because it's the only comic book on my list. Um, and it is also, as like a modern text, one of the most effective um, I've ever seen, specifically at dealing with the legacy of the trauma of World War II and specifically the Holocaust. So what Mouse is, is it is, um, it's kind of a hard, like complex novel to describe in terms of genre, is it's effectively a biography combined with an autobiography, that it is the story of Art Spiegelman relating the story of his father, Vladek Spiegelman, um, who was a Polish Jew who survived the Holocaust. He was in Auschwitz and escaped. Um, And so it is related through, in a sort of like modern day timeline, this sort of representation of Art Spiegelman talking to Vladek um, and getting the story. And as he's getting the story from Vladek, you then get like the narrativized version represented in the graphic novel. The style of the graphic novel artistically is very sort of cartoonish. Um, It's a very kind of simplified design. Um, And the sort of gimmick, broadly speaking, of the novel is that all the Jews are represented as mice um, artistically, and then all the Nazis are represented as cats. Um, And so it's like playing the sort of visual metaphor that is meant to sort of make you conscious of the sort of racial distinctions that were happening um, with the Holocaust and then also kind of break down the assumptions and the absurdity of the, like, the racial um, the philosophy of the Nazis. Um, but what makes Mouse so powerful, I think, is it's really kind of complex structure and its complex relationship to itself. Um, it is extremely experimental in form. Um, it has... Uh, like really brilliant paneling that you frequently just get very standard kind of grid form of paneling that then eventually will do something more exotic or eccentric. Um, And because it's rare that it kind of breaks out of that, 
Um, it, it's like really striking when he does so. He incorporates like real world documentation into the graphic novel as well, um, which is pretty innovative specifically for it when it came out. And it's also still very uncommon. Um, and the sort of complex, I guess what is when you try to break it down, it, what is in, an incredibly complex layered structure of the story, um, it is incredibly layered and, and complex, but when you are reading it, you never think about it, which is, I think, one of like the great achievements of Mouse, is that it is so complex in terms of the narrative framing of everything, and you're like digging down multiple layers of people telling stories to people telling stories to like this fictionalized version of Art Spiegelman learning the story, telling it to you, but then you, of course, have the real-world Art Spiegelman who's telling this to you, who is a distinct entity because... Um, his father, Vladek, passed away, I believe, in 1982. So relatively early on, the, the publishing and the writing of Mouse, um, the main subject of the novel passes away. Um, and eventually that gets brought into um, the narrative of Mouse itself. The most effective passage, and I think the thing to, like, if I should, like, describe it to break down for people, like, will probably most have effectively communicate what is so remarkable about Mouse um, my favorite page is the first page of chapter two of part two. Um, so the, it's kind of the history of it is it released serially in a magazine called Raw um, in chapters. And then eventually when you get halfway through, um, the publishes a f collected volume of what was released of Mouse at the time. And that volume, like when it was just releasing in the magazine, Mouse didn't get a lot of attention. That ma that volume got huge attention and it was massively um, successful, both in a commercial sense and a critical sense. Um, it like was winning, winning a bunch of awards and that kind of stuff. Um, and so then the subsequent chapters come out and Spiegelman incorporates that into how he's telling the story. And he's acknowledging what is happening and like is like building the critical reception and the way that people were talking about it the attention it was getting and then the money he was getting into it so again this is him the most of the story is him talking about and using the story of his father in his survival story of his father Vladek in holocaust um to write the story he's now making a lot of money off of it and so in volume two he starts to struggle with this idea and so the first page of chapter two um chapter two being called time flies um, starts with a four page or four panel grid at the first half of the page um, that is basically the same image slowly pulling back in each panel of a side view of Art Spiegelman who's normally represented as just a mouse like everybody else like a cartoon mouse um, but here he is clearly a man wearing a mouse mask over his face and he's sitting at a drawing table um, and he says Vladek died of congestive heart failure on August 18th 1982. Francois his wife and I stayed with him um, in the Catskills back in August 1979. Vladek started working as a tin man in Auschwitz in the spring of 1944. I started working on this page at the very end of February 1987. In May 1987, Francois and I are expecting a baby. Between May 16, 1944 and May 24, 1944, over 100,000 Hungarian Jews were gassed, were gassed in Auschwitz. Um, and then in this next panel, um, Spiegelman turns to the camera uh, and he says, in September 1986, after eight years of work, the first part of Mouse was published. It was a critical and commercial success. And then you move to the second half of the page, which is a huge panel that takes up the whole second half that zooms all the way out. And you now see that Spiegelman is sitting at his drawing table and his drawing table is resting on a pile of um, desiccated mice bodies uh, that have flies flying over them. It is a massive pile of dead bodies. And he says, at least 15 foreign editions are coming out. I've gotten four serious offers to turn my book into a TV special or movie. I don't want to. In May 1968, my mother killed herself. She left no note. Lately, I've been feeling depressed. And then off panel, someone says, all right, Mr. Spiegelman, we're ready to shoot. And then the rest of the chapter is him talking to different people, offering him to make adaptations of mice or of mouse um, and people asking him questions about why did you depict them as mice? Because that was a kind of controversial element of the novel at the time. Um, like, what if you had to, I think there's one line that like kind of makes me crack up where someone asks him, like, if you had to represent Israeli Jews, what kind of animal would Israeli Jews be? And our speakerman says, I have no idea. Porcupines, I guess. I don't know. Um, and it is just this sort of ridiculous um, scenario he finds himself in. And the way that that page, as you slowly kind of zoom out in each panel to this massive panel depicting what he's really feeling and what he's thinking of, which is this sort of sense of depression, 
of imposter syndrome, of this crime he's maybe committing by profiting so extremely off of the deaths of this incomparable number of people who are um, his heritage and his ancestry. Um, along with his own complicated history with his father, Vladek, where Vladek is not necessarily portrayed as like this sort of hero. Um, it's obviously like he does heroic things in order to how he like escapes Auschwitz, um, but they haven't even gotten that part in terms of the narrative of Vladek. Um, and so modern day Vladek and his relationship with Spiegelman is really complicated. Um, and it's kind of very acerbic. Um, and then as he says in that page as well, um, Spiegelman's mother committed suicide when Spiegelman was like 20. Um, and he struggles with that a lot over the course of the novel. Um, and so the construction of the novel and its ability to sort of break the fourth wall in these ways and very elegant, f elegantly flip between these different modes to present this really complex psychology, not just of the subject of the biography of Vladek, but of Art Spiegelman himself as he struggles to tell the story of his father and come to grips with his own family legacy housed in the complexities of like the legacy of the Holocaust with um, the Jewish people. Um, it is like an incredibly layered, complex text um, that is remarkably beautiful. Like it, like it made me cry basically the first time I read it. Um, I've read it multiple times at this point. Um, and the ending of it is so um, beautiful where when you get to the very end, um, you have this section where it sort of flashes back effectively to Vladek telling some of the end of the story of his narrative to Spiegelman. Again, this would have been published like five years after the real life Vladek Spiegelman had passed away. Um, and it is, uh, you, he's talking about how he got this picture taken of himself wearing these prisoner clothes, um, and sent them to, um, his wife, Art Spiegelman's mother, after he had escaped Auschwitz to kind of prove that he was alive. Um, and then they have the actual picture, the real world picture of Vladek Spiegelman wearing those prison, that prison outfit in the comic book itself and the way it sort of just like breaks reality and breaks the comic book reality of the way that these people are depicted and to show the actual man himself after you've read like 300 pages of this graphic novel um it hits home so hard the narrative of what's happening here and the the complex familial relationships that mouse is um struggling with and in terms of what i talked about with heart of darkness in terms of fiction dealing with an internal friction within itself and its author um like mouse is a textbook example of like the kind of thing that can uh, that can produce when the author is actively engaging with his own struggle and trying to tell the story he's trying to tell so if you have not read mouse um it is like if you are going to read one sort of like serious comic book that's not a superhero comic book or something like that like mouse is the one to read yeah i um i've never read mouse i have definitely though i immediately looked up and like okay i've seen a bunch of these pages and the one i think you were quoting from makes the rounds fairly regularly i feel like mm -hmm. on twitter and stuff of people rediscovering it um and it's definitely something especially after hearing you talk about it just now i feel like i i need to avail myself of at some point it is extremely good it is i mean it is like in my opinion of, of the stuff i've read it is the best work of literature composed in the past like 30 to 40 years maybe longer than that. Um, it is it is profoundly good. Awesome. All right. Well, we are on a roller coaster of tonal shifts and stylistic shifts and mm -hmm. all sorts of things, and that roller coaster ain't slowing down anytime soon because my number eight, you thought we weren't going to be able to work this into this podcast. I bet you thought we weren't going to be able to work Mobile Suit Gundam into this, but oh, oh no, okay. we did. My number eight is Mobile Suit Gundam, the original novelization by Yoshiyuki Tomino from 1979 through 1981. Uh, it is technically three books, but I think you will forgive me for just combining them because the English edition is just one big book. Um, yeah, and they're, they were, they're like, yeah. it's a, they were light novels, so they're effectively meant to be like the one full volume eventually compiled together. Yes. Uh, so it's Mobile Suit Gundam, Awakening, Escalation, and Confrontation. And, you know, when I originally picked this up when we were getting into Gundam, Sean... I think I viewed it as like a curiosity, as like this sort of historical like, boy, this is weird. Tomino, like while he was doing the show, he wrote this book and then the book influenced the movies a little bit. Like, what is this about? And it's um, this, you know, funnily enough, this was actually the first Gundam thing ever officially localized in America because Frederick L. Schott, who is a major translator of all sorts of anime and manga stuff. He's done a lot of work on uh, Osamu Tezuka. He's, he's actually translated another book on my list that we're going to get to later. Um... 
um, and is is a really great translator. He did these in the early '90s. I have one of the they originally did it as three volumes as like these little cheap paperbacks, and I have one of those. But there is a modern updated one that uses like the modern romanizations and everything from Stonebridge Press, which I would recommend any Gundam fan get. I think this is an essential work for anyone interested in Gundam or mecha anime um, or just really good like space naval fiction. Um, because like I said, I think I viewed this as a curiosity and then it became genuinely one of my favorite books. And one of my favorite books, not just because of its connection to one of my favorite TV shows, but because I think it is really, really phenomenal on its own. Um, in part because I think Tomino made the wise decision to kind of leave the show aside. It, um, it has strong connections to the show, but it is largely at a certain point its own story. It has a very different ending, uh, famously because this is the version of Gundam where Amuro dies tragically and suddenly and horrifically. Um, and, and so it has a very different ending. It has a very different middle. Book two is pretty much entirely material that has nothing to do with the TV show. Uh, books one and three have more stuff in common. Uh, and it is a version of this story where he just gets to go whole hog into world building and technical aspects and things that there just is not necessarily time for in the TV show version. Uh, and in the process creates what is essentially the story Bible for all Gundam going forward. It lays down the entire mythology for the Universal Century. It lays out a ton of the science of the Gundam universe that would get uh, not just in Tomino's future work, but other Gundams keep coming back to this for like the explanation of some things that are just actual science, like Lagrange points and stuff like that, but also like how the ships work, um, how a lot of the different things with the mobile suits themselves work. Um, obviously, a lot of the history stuff, like Mobile Suit Gundam, the origin when that is created in the manga and the anime later, just adapts whole passages from this. Unicorn Gundam adapts passages from this. Um, and so it has become like, like it is a major work in the Gundam universe, but I think it's a major work on its own. I think the most interesting thing about it is how you get to see Tomino at the start of the Gundam experience. This book is so focused on the new type philosophy, and at a certain point it almost feels like it's becoming a theology in this book, how much he gets into it. And it is this like really interesting philosophy for humanity, and he has these long passages just describing what it sort of is underneath. And it's really beautiful. It has great characterizations, you know, very different characterizations. Sela is a much more... Um, present character in this version because she winds up in a relationship with Amuro, which is very different. It deals with sex and violence much more overtly. Um, and I love it as this alternate version of my favorite TV show of all time. And I very well, if I wanted to, I could have my top 10 books, TV shows, and movie lists all have an alternate version of Gundam on it because Gundam the Show is the best show I've ever seen. The three Gundam movies are three of the best animated movies ever made. And I think this is one of my... I'm not going to say it's one of the best books ever written because I've not read enough books, but it is one of my favorite books I've ever read, certainly. Um, and I really, really love it. Um, I will just read one passage from the end of book one. Um, this is the conclusion. Um, one of the big changes this makes is that all the Lala Soon stuff is more of an inciting incident rather than a climactic thing. So this is the end of book one. As his core fighter was tossed from the area by the blast, he mercifully slipped into mumbling unconsciousness, but the fused awareness he had shared with Lala was not a dream. They had seen a future, and the future was one of promise. It was real, and it was burned into Amuro's mind. He knew that although only he and Lala had seen it, it did not belong only to them. It was vast, it was universal, and now he could rest. Sleep would be a, but a brief respite before he emerged from the depths of despair to fulfill his final destiny. Mankind was still not aware that new types had awakened, but a new future had already begun. It was UC0080, and the war was still not over. So anyway, I love this book. It's very good. Um, and I'm glad I put it on here, because can't stop, won't stop with my Gundam bullshit. Very good. I have never, I have not read through the whole thing. Like I've started and stopped it multiple times and just have been too busy to, to keep up with it. But it's definitely one of like, I think next summer um, I want to get all the way through it um, and properly read it because from what I read, it was very good. And then I would just constantly get interrupted. It's like one of the tragedies of being an English teacher is that like your reading time gets consumed by all this other shit you have to read all the time. It's like, well, there's not enough time for me to just read something I want to read on my own. Yeah. 
Totally. Uh, and it's the translation by Shout is so good and readable and feels like, like even without comparing it to the Japanese, there's such a strong sense of voice that comes through it. Um, I really appreciate that too. So Awesome. Well, it, it has worked out well um, that your number eight was Gundam. My number eight is the thing closest to Gundam that is like a powerful influence on <laughs> not just Gundam, but all war stories to come. Afterwards, it is all quiet on the Western Front by Eric Maria Remarque, uh, originally published in 1929. Um, so All Quiet on the Western Front is the most famous World War I novel. Um, it is, as, as the version that I have says very boldly on the front, the greatest war novel of all time, which is like, I, I, I love the dedication to just like fucking saying it, and I would, I fully agree. Um, all Quiet on the Western Front is a very like foundational text for how modern war stories are told. Um, it is definitely something I've brought up multiple times on Weekly Suit Gundam because I definitely, anytime we watch a Gundam thing, I think about stuff from All Quiet on the Western Front because you kind of can't do a modern war story without pulling from some of like the thematic material that All Quiet produces. Um, All Quiet is a sort of like pseudo autobiographical story. It's not exactly Eric Maria Mark's actual life story, um, which is very obvious when you get to the end of the novel because if it was, the novel would never be able to be written. Um, but it is pulls clearly from a lot of the experiences that he actually had as a um, soldier for Germany in World War I on the front lines fighting in France. Um, and so it is a story of a 19-year-old boy named um, Paul Bomber. Um, and Paul is our narrator, and it's his sort of life with this platoon as he goes through the sort of second half of World War I, going up right up about to the end of World War I. Um, and it is a, an incredibly powerful novel that is both in terms of its sort of like plotting and characterization. I think it finds ways to express and communicate things about the war just through the way it's built as a novel that is really powerful. I think its structure of chapters is really effective. It's a fairly, it's not like a long, long book, but it's a decent sized novel, about 300 pages in the version I have um, that is 12 chapters long, 12 chapters in an epilogue. Um, and each chapter is like really purposely constructed in a way that like if you wanted to make a mini series out of All Quiet on the Western Front, aside from the fact that like chapter 12 is very short, you'd probably put chapter 12 into chapter 11. Um, you would do basically an 11 episode adaptation and just take each chapter and it would work perfectly as like hour long episodes. Um, what I guess one of like the, the things about All Quiet that really pushes it to the next level for me, and obviously it's a translated version of the text um, that is like the definitive English translation um, that basically any translation you find of it is going to be by, um, well, let me find his name, uh, A.W. Ween, um, who obviously one of the things that he contributed to with the translation is the title All Quiet on the Western Front, which is just a brilliant title and a really cool translation of uh, one of the last lines of the novel um but even though it's translated the specifics of the language are so powerful um and specifically it's this way that he moves between this really stark frank description of what is happening in the war um when you have big battle scenes like it is just very explicit in people getting shot in the stomach and their intestines falling out and them screaming in pain and and that kind of stuff that when it's violent it's extremely violent but most of the novel is just these guys living on the front line in horrible conditions um, who are heavily traumatized, having to live their lives. And it's not that they're like constant under a constant threat of death in every single chapter. A lot of it is them just like shooting the shit and trying to like figure out what's going on in the world. Um, and Paul, as the narrator, is an incredibly reflective character who is like thinking about the world all the time. Um, and it moves into these passages that are incredibly dreamlike that I find very haunting and very beautiful. Um, so the section that I want to read to kind of like illustrate that is it maybe it's a slightly long excerpt, but it's my favorite scene from the book. Um, and it is in, I believe it's chapter five. Uh, so it comes after chapter four, which is the first big battle scene um, that features a gas attack in it. Um, it's very violent, very dramatic. Um, and then after that, you get chapter five. That's mostly about Paul and the other main character, Kat, Stanislaus Kaczynski, who is a much older man. He's about 40 years old um, and is like basically Paul's mentor. Um, and that's where you get this sort of quiet scene with them where they find this small hut kind of off to the side and they catch a goose and they're basically going to make a goose dinner together. And this is where you get one of the other sort of major elements of the novel I find very powerful is that it, it is um, it has like this kind of homoerotic element with Paul's relationship with Kat 
um, that I find very powerful and effective um, in particular how it develops. And this is where you get this first hint of it. So, so this is them um, in this hut together cooking this goose and it is after this big battle and they're kind of like trying to calm down um, and have this moment of light of like lightness with each other. We are two men, two minute sparks of life. Outside is the night in the circle of death. We sit on the edge of it, crouching in danger. The grease drips from our hands. In our hearts, we are close to one another, and the hour is like the room, flecked over with the lights and shadow of our feelings cast by a quiet fire. What does he know of me, or I of him? Formerly, we should not have had a single thought in common. Now we sit, with a goose between us, and feel in unison are so intimate that we do not even speak. It takes a long time to roast a goose, even when it is young and fat. So we take turns. One base sit while the other lies down and sleeps. A grand smell gradually fills the hut. The noises without increase in volume pass into my dream and yet linger in my memory. In a half sleep, I watch Cat dip and raise the ladle. I love him, his shoulders, his angular stooping figure. And at the same time, I see behind him woods and stars and a clear voice utters words that bring me peace to me a soldier in big boots, belt and knapsack, taking the road that lies before him under the high heaven, quickly forgetting and seldom sorrowful, forever pressing on under the wide night sky. A little soldier in a clear voice, and if anyone were to caress him, he would hardly understand this soldier with the big boots and the shut heart, who marches because he is wearing big boots and has forgotten all else but marching. Beyond the skyline is a country with flowers lying so still that he would like to weep, there are sights there that he has not forgotten because he never possessed them, perplexing yet lost to him. Are not his twenty summers there? Is my face wet? And where am I? Cat stands before me. His gigantic stooping shadow falls upon me like home. He speaks gently. He smiles and goes back to the fire. Then he says, it's done. Yes, Cat. I stir myself. In the middle of the room shines the brown goose. We take out our collapsible forks and our pocket knives and each cuts off a leg. With it, we have army bread dipped in gravy. We eat slowly and with gusto. How does it taste, cat? Good. And yours? Good, cat. We are brothers and press on one another to choicest pieces. Afterwards, I smoke a cigarette and cat a cigar. There's still a lot left. We go to our hut. Again, there is the lofty sky with the stars and the oncoming dawn, and I pass beneath it, a soldier with big boots and a full belly, a little soldier in the early morning. But by my side, stooping and angular, goes Cat, my comrade. The outlines of the huts are upon us in the dawn, like a dark, deep sleep. So that passage to me really shows um, the tone of the novel and its ability to induce this dreamlike state as Paul is flipping in and out of consciousness, thinking about himself in the third person as this soldier wearing boots that are too big for him. Um, and longing after this sort of like memory of some world, some field of flowers, of some peaceful, innocent place that he can never go back to because of his experiences, um, and him trying to find solace um, in this relationship he has with Kaczynski. Um, and it is a passage that when I've, I've, this is now the second time I've taught this novel, we're basically at the end of it with my 10 honors class. Um, and every time I teach that section, it's so fascinating seeing um, my students struggle with trying to come to understand that it's like just because the novel was written in 1929 doesn't mean it can't be gay because it's like that relationship between Paul and Kat is way deeper than just being friends it's way deeper than being like comrades in war um and and there is like this like true tender description of love between these two characters um that I find incredibly powerful as this like one light in the darkness of the war that they're living in um that then you know I don't want to spoil the ending but like it's if you know how like war stories end in the way that war stories are tragedies and you know if you watch a movie like rogue one and like all the characters die at the end of rogue one and like does that kind of thing um it's like all quiet on the western front sort of starts that tradition where the last couple of chapters are so harrowing as basically every single character you meet gets picked off one by one um over the course of the the final summer of the war in 1918 um so if you are someone who is um really likes our weekly suit Gundam stuff and really likes mobile suit Gundam, particularly the Tomino Gundams. Um, I think All Quiet on the Western Front has a lot there for you because it is dealing with a lot of very similar themes about warfare, adolescence, technology, those things that for me are the three, the sort of like 
the, the confluence between those three things are the main thematic concern of Gundam, and it's the main thematic concern of All Quiet as well um, in this moment of sort of in this inflection point in human history where technology gets to the point um, where it allows this sort of global trauma on a scale that humanity had never experienced before, like the colony drop in a mobile suit Gundam or something like that. So if you're interested in that and like want to get a like more real world literary version of some a similar kind of story with similar thematic interests, All Quiet on the Western Front is the novel to go to. Yeah, I really want to read this book at some point because the movie, which was made in 1930, yeah. uh, produced by Carl Lemley, who is best known as the Universal guy who produced all the Universal monster movies. But this was one of his first big projects because Carl Lemley was effectively the guy who guided Universal into the sound age. And so All Quiet, the, the movie, is one of the first sound films ever made, but it has much more of a style of like a silent film. Um, but it is, it's the best war movie ever made. It will never be topped. It's like, it can't be to every war movie takes from it just in the same mm -hmm. way you're describing with the book that like war stories just inevitably it just leaves that kind of footprint um and i, I have not read the book but i've seen the movie and, and i find it brilliant so i need to read the book because I, that passage you read is beautiful and i know i would get a hell of a lot out of it you know and one of the things you you haven't gone into sean is one of the brilliant things about this book and its impact on world history and criticism is that it's from the german perspective it yeah. is it is one of the things that makes it kind of unimpeachably strong as an anti-war story is that it's from the German perspective and in the West when we read it, we're reading it from like this was the quote unquote enemy, right? Um, yeah. And, you know, that that lends it something that, uh, you know, it was not necessarily intended to be that act of radical empathy because it's written by a German, but... Um, it gives you that as an American reader. And the film translating that to Hollywood, I can't believe they did that in 1930. I cannot believe they did something that deeply empathetic and, like, didn't try to adapt it to, like, be British people or something, you know? Um, yeah, like, one of the things I, mean, I it's find it's British actors, but, yeah. Yeah, but one of the thing I, things I find fascinating about All Quiet, both the book and the movie, is that both of them were so well-received on release, um, which is not common for, like, big works of literature. Like, the next one on my list is one that was in obscurity for decades, um it now is like considered like one of the best novels ever written um but all quiet is like it were released um i mean it was hugely popular it was released serially which was typical of novels for most of the history of the form of the novel um and the magazine it released in was very popular and then when it was compiled um in 1929 like it sold out it sold millions of copies it was within a year of its publication translated into 30 different languages around the world virtually every single market it released into was extremely accepted uh, receptive to it including the american market um, and then the movie gets made and the movie wins like best director and all this stuff at, at like a very early Academy Awards. Uh, it won, it basically won the equivalent of best production and best director. So Carl Lemley and Lewis Milestone both took trophies home. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's shocking to me because I think it like gives you a little bit of a perspective of like how intense the, like the trauma of World War One must have been for everywhere in the world that like this novel was so beloved and taken um, until... The German or the Nazis took over in Germany, and then All Quiet on the Western Front is one of the first books that the Nazis burn um, because it is such a frank depiction of war. And a frank depiction of war is not one that's going to be super flattering to the army and to army life and to the officials running the army. And if you are a fascist military state, you can't have that. So they burn the book um, immediately, um, which is another reason to say, hey, fuck the Nazis. Um, but if the Nazis are burning your book, your book's probably pretty fucking good. Yeah. And they did it to the film, too. The film was yeah. um, denounced as a Jewish film um, uh, and, and burned in, in and banned in Germany. Um, so, yeah. No, I, I think its reception is fascinating, too. I mean, just look at the movies that won Best Picture on either side of it. It's the Broadway Melody and the Western film Cimarron. So, like, it's just, it's just such... It's so out of left field for, like, what was being praised. And, and yeah, it's an amazing film and book and everything. Yeah. So, yeah. All right, my number seven could not be more different. Um, my number seven is also the weirdest thing I have on this list because it is a, it's a book, it's a bound collection of pages, but it is not a continuous thing. Um, it is a collection of writings by my favorite director, Mr. Hayao Miyazaki, called Starting Point, which um, was published in 1996 in Japan, and it is a collection of, basically Studio Ghibli put it together, um, as a collection of all of his public writings, speeches, and interviews from 1979 
which is the year he makes his first film, the uh, Castle of Cagliostro, the Lupin the Third film, uh, through 1996, which is when this was published. So this is on the cusp of Princess Mononoke, which was the one that broke every record in Japan at the time and all of that, but Mononoke is not in this book. Um, and then there is a second volume that they did in the late 2000s called Turning Point, which I also like, but I don't like as much. Um, and then this one was published in English. And I actually own two copies of this because I love it so much. I have one paperback that I used for like notes and one hardcover that I refused to write in. Um, but it was published in, in uh, English in 2009, so while we were in high school. And I became obsessed with it. Um, I read this book like it was the fucking Bible. Um, and in some ways to me, like as sacrilegious as this will sound, it kind of is because it is this direct window into the mind of someone whose work touches me so deeply as a filmmaker but i also think his perspective on the world is so fascinating you know you know how sean on twitter every so often a hayao miyazaki like clip will go viral of him mm -hmm. like saying something grumpy um but insightful and that's this whole book is is he is so insightful and he is frequently grumpy. You get his perspective on mecha anime, which I've met, read before on this because he fucking hates it. And it's very funny. Um, but he talks about life and he talks about philosophy and, and capitalism and things like that while also getting into the work of animation and the daily grind of it. And it is a, I think, launches through the book a pretty intense structural critique of the anime industry in which he works which is one of the most fascinating things about it um and i love it to death one thing i like about this one more than the second book is this first book so much of it is well miyazaki is an up-and-comer like so much of this is before nausicaa is is out which is really what puts him on the map um and then there is stuff from after that point but like um, you know, he is still kind of growing his legend. So much of this is from the era when he is a television director, not a movie director. And a lot of it is stuff he wrote down and was published in magazines or speeches he gave directly, like he wrote and then gave. Uh, and the second book is more like interviews and production memos and stuff, because at the point, once he's done Princess Mononoke, he is not someone who is sitting down and writing magazine columns, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so you just get a lot of it in this volume, and it is it has been a major influence on me. I broke it down. I used it so heavily when I was um, working on various projects I've done, like my honors thesis and my master's thesis. Um, I still use it. I wrote an essay last year when I was in a film theory class arguing that this should be accepted into the canon of film theory. Um, there are other books by filmmakers we we use in the canon of film theory, like all of the French New Wave stuff, most obviously, but also like um, Jean Epstein, like a lot of French directors we do this with. But there just aren't as many other directors where we say what they've written should be considered theory, and I really think Miyazaki's work in here should be considered film theory, and I believe that very strongly, and I think there's some really beautiful, powerful stuff about the art of film, and just I this this book lives so heavily in my mind and in my mind space. Um, that I had to have it on here. I love this book to death. Um, I obviously love Miyazaki to death. I'll give one quote here that I used. I use, I've used this quote several times. Uh, this is from 1979. So this is, again, he's at this point made Cagliostro, but he is a TV person still at this point. He's young. He says, Personally, I was never more passionate about manga than when preparing for my college entrance exams. It's a period of life when young people appear to have a great deal of freedom, but are in many ways actually very oppressed. Just when they find themselves powerfully attracted to members of the opposite sex, they have to really crack the books. To escape from this depressing situation, they often find themselves wishing that they could live in a world of their own, a world they can say is truly theirs, a world unknown even to their parents. I often refer to this feeling as one of yearning for a lost world. It's a sense that although you may currently be living in a world of constraints, if you were free from those constraints, you would be able to do all sorts of things. And I love that quote because he's putting his finger on something that would later be the crux of so many of his films. I think that's what Kiki's Delivery Service is about. I think that's what Whisper of the Heart is about. Uh, I think that's what Spirited Away is about in a lot of ways. And you get that throughout. It's so cool to read all of this early writing by him and then go, well, and then he went and made movies about it. You know, mm -hmm. when he had the freedom to do it, he had been thinking about this stuff for so long. Um, he is just one of the most idiosyncratic people to hear about. Um, and I love that this book got translated because I love that they did this one first because this largely does not cover 
the famous Miyazaki stuff. This is from a period where he's working on a lot of stuff that just has never been localized. It has never been subtitled uh, professionally. It has never been released in the West. Um, at the time this came out, I don't think even the Lupin the Third TV shows he'd done had gotten an official Western release. They have since then by Discotech. Um, but like, you know, he talks about his show Future Boy Conan. Um, he talks about some of the stuff he did with Takahata, like um, Heidi Girl of the Alps that has, like all of these you can find fan subbed online uh, now. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like when the Gundam book got localized and it's like, well, none of the other Gundam stuff was out. So it's really fascinating. This one is also translated by Frederick Schott, along with Beth Carey. And it's a great translation. You can just hear Miyazaki's voice if you have ever heard him speak it is so clearly him and that is the mark of I think a good translation um is if they get that across so this is a book I I recommend heavily very different than anything else we're talking about but I love it awesome yes I mean th like this is like some of the stuff that I was excited for do this for you with this podcast is because I knew that all my stuff would be like works of fiction. And I was like, I hope Jonathan puts something else on his. <laughs> because I know you, yes. you've read a lot more of that stuff and are more in that world than I am. Um, yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, awesome. All right, your number seven. My number seven, a novel very near and dear to my heart, is Moby Dick, semicolon, or comma, The Whale. Back when novels were rad and they had two titles and they had just this cool <laughs> semicolon or comma structure. There's maybe one other book on my list that does the same thing. Um, but most known now as just Moby Dick, um, the magnum opus of Herman Melville, um, also author, noted author of the best short story ever written, Bartleby the Scrivener. Um, and Moby, Moby Dick was um, released in three volumes originally, um, but was finally compiled into one large volume in 1851. Um, as I kind of alluded to in talking about All Quiet, Moby Dick was not um, well received upon release. It wasn't, I think, until like the late 1800s. So almost like a whole half century passed before it started to be taken up as what we think of it now as like one of the main candidates for the quote unquote great American novel. Um, Moby Dick is a novel I think has been done dirty in public um, perception. Not in that like people don't think it's good, but that I think people who haven't read it don't know what Moby Dick is because Moby Dick is weird as fuck. It's probably the weirdest thing on my list. It is an utterly bizarre um, novel that, I mean, honestly, a lot of versions, if you buy them, you need to make sure you buy what is like a complete version of Herman Melville or of, of Melville's uh, Moby Dick. I have the third Norton critical edition, which is very good. Um, it's nice and concise, even though it's a very large book. They sort of get it down into a reasonable volume you can carry with you and has a bunch of critical stuff, as you would expect, um, essays and stuff like that for a Norton edition. Um, it's very good. Um, but yeah, like it's got all this weird shit in it that is cut out in a bunch of versions uh, that I feel like I understand why you would cut it out. And if you're a younger reader, I would maybe say you can skip it. But to me, what Moby Dick is, is not this like grand narrative of revenge and obsession um, of Ahab, which is what we all think of it as. We all think of it as that this like crazy dude with a peg leg going after this, this the damn white whale and he's so driven by revenge. And that is a part of the novel. That's, that's obviously there. I'm not saying that's not in there. Um, but like what the novel's really interested in is just this weird, eccentric, eclectic um, journey of all these men on this whaling vessel. Um, Herman Melville himself like sailed a lot and, and worked when he was younger as a whaler. Um, and it's just obsessed with this life on the sea and the intimacy of these men because Moby Dick is also the gayest novel ever written. And I will prove it to you with a passage I'll read in a little bit. Um, and it's the intimacy of the crew members. Um, and, and just like the odd goings on and then this like love of and fascination with the whale itself as an animal, um, that includes like an extended section called the cytology chapters, cytology being the word for the study of whales, where Herman Melville goes into deep detail over his own personal taxonomy of the whale that is sometimes scientifically accurate and sometimes not. And by which I don't mean that it's not accurate by the modern standards of science i mean at the time herman melville would have understood that these things some of these things he's saying were not true but he says them anyways because they are more of this like fantastical depiction of what the whale is in his imagination rather than maybe those slightly more mundane biological realities of the animal um it has like a long flowing paragraphs that are tributes to like the narwhal and whether the narwhal really is a whale what is the horn why does it have this horn um, that, that are like totally non-narrativized. They're just come the fuck out of nowhere. 
um, and they just hit you like a ton of bricks, and, and it, the the plot of the novel comes to a screeching halt, and that can probably be a turnoff to people, and that's why they would be excised. But if you're in the mode of what I think the novel's trying to get you in, which is this very fluid response as a reader to just go with the flow, um, like Moby Dick is composed of very short chapters generally. There's a couple of long chapters, um, particularly one, another weird move the novel makes where it basically has a really massive chapter in the middle that sets is takes place after the end of the novel um, that just kind of comes out of nowhere and it's like a 20-page chapter. Um, but Moby Dick has, let's see... Uh, it has 135 chapters, which is split across 410 pages in my edition. So it's a little bit less than 10 pages per chapter on average. In reality, most chapters are about um, four to five pages long with a couple of like 20 page chapters in there. Um, so it is this really, I think, well paced novel that you just sit down, read for like 15 minutes, read a full chapter and just get this one little story about life on the sea or Belleville just talking about whales for a little bit. Or there are times where it just suddenly turns into a play. Um, it is like heavily influenced by Shakespeare and a lot of the language and different stuff. Like a lot of the Ahab stuff is extremely Shakespearean um, on purpose. And so it just has like a chapter where there are stage directions and stuff like that in there all of a sudden. Or it's just all literally formatted like if you had a copy of a Shakespeare play in front of you. Um, and it's written out like that. So it is extremely experimental. Um, it is, I would say, like along with Mouse, um, there are like three novels in here that are books in here in my list that are extremely experimental in structure. Mouse, um, Moby Dick, and one other. And one thing that just makes it so fascinating is this experiment. Um, so I think there's two passages I want to read some from. Um, they're the first one I want to read to give you a sense of for people who are looking for the Ahab stuff and you want the Shakespearean epic um, grudge revenge story. Uh, that is here, and I'll prove it to you because I think Melville has, um, outside of Shakespeare, like he's got the best fake Shakespeare I've ever read. Um, so this is um, basically what if you did a play version of Moby Dick, this would be a soliloquy that Ahab says. Um, so it's, this is all from Ahab's perspective. This is also after you get a parenthetical stage direction that says, waving his hand, he moves from the window. Um, so again, it's just like out of nowhere, you just get a fucking stage direction. I don't know why. It's a novel, not a play, um, but he just gives that to you. And then this is just in the head of Ahab. He says, "'Twas not so hard a task. I thought to find one stubborn at the least, but my one cogged circle fits into all their various wheels, and they revolve. Or if you will, like so many anthills of powder, they all stand before me, and I their match.' Oh, hard, that to fire others, the match itself must needs be wasting. What I've dared, I've willed, and what I've willed, I will do. They think me mad, Starbuck does, but I am demonic. I am madness maddened, that wild madness that's only calm to comprehend itself. The prophecy was that I should be dismembered, and I, I lost this leg. I now prophesy that I will dismember my dismemberer. Now then be the prophet and the fulfiller one. That's more than ye, ye great gods, ever were. I laugh and hoot at ye, ye cricket players, ye pugilists, ye deaf burks and blinded bendigos. I will not say, as schoolboys do to bullies, take some from one of your own size, don't pommel me. No, ye've knocked me down and I am up again, but ye have run and hidden. Come forth from behind your cotton bags, I have no long gun to reach ye. Come, Ahab's compliments to ye. Come and see if ye can swerve me. Swerve me? Ye cannot swerve me, else ye swerve yourselves. Man has ye there. Swerve me? The path to my fixed purpose is laid with iron rails, whereon my soul is grooved to run. Over unsounded gorges, through the rifled hearts of mountains, under torrents, beds unerringly, I rush. Knots an obstacle, knots an angle to the iron way. That's a goof. Some good fucking shit that like that is some like like Shakespeare himself would blush Um, like it is such a good like a purposeful mimicking of the language of Shakespeare. It is unbelievable, particularly that opening metaphor where he says um, my one cog circle fits into all their various wheels and they revolve like what a fucking line of English language that is. So if you want that stuff. This novel has all this stuff. Like, if you like the ending of Star Trek II Wrath of Khan, you like when he says, from hell's heart I stab at thee, which is a quote from Moby Dick, like, it's got a bunch of that stuff in there, and Ahab is a very cool character. But 
it also is in Herman Melville tradition. It is hilarious. It is so funny. And it is also extremely gay because Herman Melville was gay. Like he wrote love letter, love letters to fucking Nathaniel Hawthorne, who he lived like, um, like a couple of houses down from. Um, and he had like this, like unrequited uh, love for Nathaniel Hawthorne, which is if you want to read it, um, like you can read some of what he wrote, like reviews of Hawthorne's books that are just like the horniest things you've ever read. Like it is crazy. Um, and I love it. And I love Melville um, as a writer and like as a person, he was fascinating. Um, and so if you're someone who, and this is, again, this is a conversation I've had with some of my 10 honors kids when we talked about that section from All Quiet on the Western Front. If you think like you hear Moby Dick and you're like, ha ha, that's funny, like Moby Dick, because it's like a dick. But back in the day, they wouldn't have thought it that way. It's just like weird old people who didn't realize that we would laugh at them. It's like, no, dick was a word for penis back in 1851 also like we we're almost 100 percent sure of it the first recorded usage of the word dick as a slang term for penis is like in the 1880s but like slang terminology is not usually recorded down so you can't get a like reliable etymology and almost certainly if we have a recorded version in the 80s that was a word that people were using for penis in the 1850s um it is a giant white whale um it is like the most phallic thing you could possibly do it is not a coincidence that it's called moby dick um, that Ahab is, you know, effectively castrated by him. Um, and if you want to read like Ahab as a character who is like at odds with his own sort of homosexuality, like that is a very clear reading of the book. And that's why he has this grudge. Um, but the main character, um, oh God, Ishmael. Like I was like, what's the first line of the book? Right, I am Ishmael. Um, Ishmael has like a very sort of like homoerotic relationship with most of the other crew members, particularly Queequeg. Um, and later in the book, in chapter 94, you have a, a chapter called A Squeeze of the Hand um, that is about they have killed a sperm whale um, and brought it back onto the deck and they have opened up the head of the sperm whale. And if you don't know why a sperm whale is called a sperm whale, it's because it has a giant organ filled sack in its head that is filled with a milky white fluid that when they first discovered this whalers in the early um, 1700s, they thought that that was the sperm of the whale, like literally. It's not. Um, I don't even know if we actually like fully understand why they have this fluid that we now, now call spermaceti. Um, but obviously, every, like it, it, it's not an accident. Like it is called a sperm whale on purpose because they thought it was sperm because it has this weird fluid that looks like sperm. Um, and if you take the fluid out, it will harden into a waxy like substance. So that's one of the reasons why they're primarily hunting sperm whales in Moby Dick is to get this substance and sell it. So you have this, this section in the novel where they have killed this sperm whale, they've brought it onto the deck um, and they're opening up its head and getting all the, the sperm out of its head. Uh, and then you have this from Ishmael talking about this. As I sit there at my ease, cross-legged on the deck, after the bitter exertion at the windlass under blue tranquil sky, the ship under indolent sail and gliding so serenely along, as I bathed my hands among those soft, gentle globules of infiltrated tissues woven almost within the hour, as they richly broke to my fingers and discharged all their opulence, like fully ripe grapes their wine, as I snuffed up that uncontaminated aroma, literally and truly like the smell of spring violets, I declare to you that for the time I lived as in a musky meadow, I forgot all about our horrible oath and that inexpressible sperm. I washed my hands in my heart of it. I almost began to credit the old Paracelsian uh, superstition that sperm is of rare vir virtue in allaying the heat of anger, um, which is referring to a superstition where if you ejaculate, you will not be as mad. Um, while bathing in that bath, I felt divinely free from all ill will or petulance or malice of any sort whatsoever. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze all the morning long. I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted into it. I squeezed that sperm till strange sort of insanity came over me, and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborer's hands in it. So they're all around it together, squeezing into the head of this whale. So that's he's talking about he's squeezing their hands also, because they're all um, in a circle around this whale. Mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. Such an abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget, that at last I was continually squeezing their hands and looking up into their eyes sentimentally, as much as to say, oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish any social acerbities or know the slightest ill humor or envy? Come, let us squeeze hands all round. Nay, let us all squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. Would that I could keep squeezing that sperm forever. For now, since by many prolonged repeated experiences, I have perceived that in all cases, man must eventually lower or at least shift his conceit of attainable felicity not placing it anywhere in the intellect or the fancy, but in the wife 
the heart, the bed, the table, the saddle, the fireside, the country. Now that I have perceived all this, I am ready to squeeze case eternally. In thoughts of the visions of the night, I saw long rows of angels in paradise, each with his hands in a jar of spermaceti. You know, I, I didn't predict that this episode would have by far the most discussion of sperm in the history of the Weekly Stuff podcast, but it has, and uh, I think that's fitting. It is, it is, the novel is fucking nuts. It is so, like, and again, if that sound, <laughs> like, that passage sounded funny to you, it is supposed to sound funny and ridiculous and, like, joyous in this weird way. Um, and, and Moby Dick is chock full of all that kind of stuff. It is, like, it is, it is one of the most bizarre novels I've ever read, and I love it to death. Um, and, uh, and it is, it is, the funniest part about it to me is I talked to my mom after I read this book and asked her if she had ever read it. And she told me that she had read it in high school. And the image, the, the thought of all these teenage girls in like a, a high school in upstate New York from like a like, you know, lower middle class neighborhood reading Moby Dick together and not and this is this would be like in the early 60s and not seeing how profoundly gay that was because it wasn't something that you would read into the novel because it wasn't expected. Like you wouldn't have the frame or the lens for it. You'd maybe think it's a little funny or weird, but be like, well, that couldn't mean that because this novel is like a hundred years old. When Moby Dick came out, one of the reasons why it wasn't well received is because everyone was reading. It was like, what the fuck is this? Like they had no way of understanding because it wasn't socially acceptable to be open about anything like that at the time. And it's just hilarious and tragic to me that it's like it is this such a famous novel and so many people have read it but the idea of like this very repressed uh, like group of teenagers reading this novel and not seeing what it is actually talking about in a scene with all these grown men standing around a barrel full of sperm and squeezing each other's hands in the sperm and one of them thinking about how like the greatest happiness in the world would be if they could all melt together into this vat of sperm like how do you not see what that is fucking talking about? It is, it is hilarious. That's amazing. I will say Moby Dick, I have not read it. But it has the distinction of being the book I have not read that I am most certain I would love if I did read. Yes, um, absolutely. And I want to read it and in part because transitioning to my next few books, we are now going to enter my uh, naval fiction filibuster. <laughs> because I love all of that and I love weird shit. So I think I would like Moby Dick, Sean. I think you would. It's very, very good. People owe it to themselves. Uh, it lives up to the hype, and it, it succeeds it, because it has all the stuff you're hyped for, and it has all this other great shit that you have no ideas in there. Oh, that's great. All right, so my number six. My number six is Post Captain by Patrick O'Brien. This is from 1972, and this is the second volume of the Aubrey Macherin series, also known as the Master and Commander series, this is the series of books, naval fiction again, about Captain Jack Aubrey and his friend and uh, uh, surgeon on the crew, Stephen Maturin. I think best known in modern pop culture for the 2003 Peter Weir movie, Master and Commander of the Far Side of the World, which stars Russell Crowe and Paul Bettany. And that movie is great. It is one of the great films of the 2000s. It is one of the great, it, it is probably the greatest naval film ever made. Um, it is a phenomenal movie. But that movie is only kind of the tip of the iceberg of a representation of what makes the books great because Patrick O'Brien was this guy who just knew a story stupid amount about old boats and the Napoleonic Wars. And he wrote with an authority and an immersion in his books about Aubrey and Maturin that you look at today and it is insane that these books were written in the 1960s through the 1990s and not in the 1800s contemporaneously because that's how they read. Like I will say the first time I ever tried reading the first book, Master and Commander, was when I was... I think in middle school, and, and it's not a book for middle schoolers, <laughs> but I tried reading it and I was just, I was like alienated. I didn't get the language and I just thought, okay, well clearly this book was written in like 1810 and it's just too old and I put it back on the shelf. I like got it from the library. It wasn't written in the 1800s. It was written in the 1960s. And you will just, you, if you did not know, if they took the date off the book and you knew nothing about it and you started reading Master and Commander, you would say, yes, this was written contemporaneously with its period. It just, it had to be right. No, Patrick O'Brien was just that good. He knew that much. Like, there is no 
there are few pieces of like fiction that have probably been written with as much authority about the subject. Like Moby Dick would probably be another one that is coming from of like obsessively researched. Um, and and this, this, these do not get weird like Moby Dick. It is all integrated into the fiction. Um, but they are great books if you have if if you have like an interest in old ships and naval warfare and the Napoleonic Wars and that kind of stuff. It is borderline fetishistic on how much you will get of like just you know all of the naval terminology you will it is learning through immersion um the first book does do a good amount to kind of educate you because it is you have parts told from Maturin's point of view and he is a newcomer he is a surgeon but he has never been on a ship before so they will explain things to him it's kind of like the thing where you have someone on their first day of work and that's how you learn the business um but after that point i mean it is just full-on immersion in this world and these books work because of the two characters who give the series its name, Jack Aubrey and Stephen Maturin, who are just a perfect duo of characters. Um, they are like Kirk, Spock, McCoy, only in like two figures instead of three, in terms of like this balance of different perspectives on the world that, that work together. Aubrey is this brash you know, man of action who often gets himself in trouble by being too brash. Um, there's a big thread through a lot of the early books of he is in debt with all these different people in the second book. The one I'm talking about here has a whole thing where he has to get out of debtor's prison and stuff. Um, but he is also a great leader of men and captain. And Stephen Maturin is a renaissance man. And this is actually the biggest thing the movie doesn't capture because I'm not sure they could. Um, is that Maturin, the movie gets this, that he is a doctor and a natural list um in like the 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 Dawkin, Dawkins um the the um the tradition of like the 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 evolution of species by Darwin mm -hmm. um and he does, does all that and they get that in the movie but he is also a spy for the British Navy who speaks a bunch of languages and is a polyglot and goes and like does espionage and stuff um and and he is also a musician you get this in the movie as well he and Aubrey both play uh, he plays the cello Aubrey plays the violin um I might have that backwards but they have this appreciation for classical music. It's actually what brings them together in the first book is they're at a music performance and uh, Aubrey annoys Matrin because he is he is um, conducting along because he's so into it and it keeps annoying Matrin and then the next day they become friends over this. Um, but Matrin is this renaissance man who does all of these crazy things um, and and is this fascinating character and is probably the... I think people, critics usually call Matrin like the great creation of Patrick O'Brien and it's true. Um, but he wrote all these books and there are 20 total of the Aubrey Maturin series and for an extremely long running series like that it is known among fans as having like no weak links like there is not like one book that's great and one book that's terrible it is like this very consistent people love it I unfortunately have not read all 20 yet um, I've read about a quarter I've read the first five and I love them to death and if I if I had the time to just sit around and read whatever I wanted all the time, which I sadly do not, um, this is just, I would probably read these books on a fucking loop. Um, I love them so much. There's a scene in Parks and Recreation where Ron Swanson, um, everyone else is doing work, and he sits out in a lawn chair and he says, I'm going to read this book about this old ship. Please do not bother me. And he's holding Master and Commander. That is me. That is the heart of who I am as a person, I think, a little bit, is I want to sit around and read my book about an old ship. But my favorite one of the ones I've read is the second book, Post Captain. It stands in here for all the other books, but I also think Post Captain is the most remarkable of them. Um, Post Captain is the longest by far in the series. It's over 500 pages. Um, and it has this just giant epic plot. Like you could imagine if they did this as a movie, it would have to be like four and a half hours long with a big intermission because it is almost operatic in scale of it starting in England with, with uh, Aubrey no longer has a ship after the events of the first book and he wants to become post-captain, which is the term for like becoming a full permanent captain in the British Navy. Um, and he winds up going to debtor's prison or he's evading debtor's prison with Matrin who like takes him to Italy and then there's or I, I might have the countries wrong but takes him to another country I think it's Italy or France and they meet some of their enemies from the last book and hang out with them and then they have to flee that because the Napoleonic like wars break out again uh, and then he gets this ship called the Polycrest and and there's all these big battles and then there's this amazing battle where the Polycrest sinks but but Aubrey wins the day and then they get another ship so there's it's it's full of events but it also is and critics all say this about post captain it is the clear homage to patrick o'brien's favorite author and one of my favorite authors jane austen 
Um, O'Brien takes a lot of his style uh, from Jane Austen. He is he is more openly, I would say, funny and acerbic, where Jane Austen kind of couches it in, in an interesting way. But there is that very clear sense of style. It's part of what makes his books sound like they are from the early 1800s, is he has a very Austen-esque voice. And Post Captain does some of the comedy of manner stuff that Jane Austen is famous for in um, exploring the love lives of these two characters. This is where Aubrey meets the woman Sophie, who he will eventually marry. Um, and, and so you have this entire sort of um, part early in the book that is on land and is, again, this kind of like comedy of manners um, book um, that is really compelling. And I think having that mixed in with all the naval stuff and when Patrick O'Brien writes a naval battle, it is the most exciting thing in the world. He is so fucking good at it. And I think the best ones I've read are in Post Captain. Um, but it is this great combination. It was the second book. It was the one I think. I think the one of the longest gaps in the series is between the first and second books because it feels like this is one he really spent a lot of time. Like that first book was a success, and then you come back and like kind of pour your heart into it. And I feel like that's what Post Captain is. Um, and I love all the other ones I've read, and I look forward to doing the whole series one day. It's long. It's <laughs> together. It would be you know like two great Chinese novels long, I feel mm -hmm. like. If you put Journey to the West and uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms together, then you would get the word count of like this giant fucking series. So one day I'll do it. I have not yet, but it's enough for Post Captain to be in my top ten. And um, God, these are good. These are just such good fucking books. Awesome. Yes, this is like the one thing that I like whenever on a podcast, and it happens more on Weekly Suit Gundam than the main podcast, but you just get to have your like random... This reminds me of the thing from from this one book, and it's like the naval tactics and this and that and the other thing. I'm like, cool, awesome. It's, this, <laughs> this is is a world I've I'm the, my I'm not into the naval military stuff. I I'm just into whaling. Um, I'm just a Moby Dick man myself, but I respect it. Awesome. Uh, and there's there's more from me later, but but for now, Sean, what's your number six? Okay, so my number six. This is uh the the complicated one on the list. Um, because this is my Shakespeare slot. So um, I wrestled a little bit with whether or not to count Shakespeare. Um, and I ultimately went with, like, yeah, I'll put a Shakespeare in here for two reasons. One, I don't think we're ever going to do the, here's just the Shakespeare podcast. Maybe we'll do that one day. Um, but I'm not counting on it. So I'm going to take my Shakespeare when I can get my Shakespeare. Um, and that also, while, yes, Shakespeare is theater and it is plays, um, the way it has been recorded in modern society is more as a work of literature. It is, it is, I disagree with it, but it is studied effectively as books, uh, more or less. Um, that They also perform the plays, but we look at them as uh, pieces of literature, which is kind of a complicated way of how that ended up happening over the course of the 19th century. But it's one of the main ways that it's thought of and taught uh, as in modern society. So I think it earns its place in the list in that sense. Um, and so then to pick a Shakespeare, because I, I had to narrow it down to one Shakespeare, I've basically made a top 10 list within my top 10 list. I'm not going to talk about any of the other ones here, but I am going to just run through. These are my top 10 leading to what my number one is. Then when I get to my number one, I'll talk about it. So these are my top 10 Shakespeare's, um, Shakespeare plays. And you'll notice immediately that I mostly just like the tragedies because I only have one of his comedies on this list. I think the comedies are good, but they're not the thing I'm interested in with Shakespeare. So my number 10 Shakespeare is Richard III. My number nine, my one comedy is Merchant of Venice. My number eight is Romeo and Juliet. My number seven is Othello. My number six is Richard II, the most underrated of all the Shakespeare plays, Richard II. It's, it's very good. so good. Um, it is I Will Die on That Hill, that Richard II is better than Richard III. Fucking come at me. Um, my number five is Julius Caesar. My number four is Macbeth. My number three is Henry IV, Part One. Um, I will also die on the hill that Henry IV, Part One is one of his best, and Henry V is not a particularly interesting Shakespeare play. Um, and then oh, I agree completely. Yeah. Henry IV, Part One is maybe the best history. It's so good. Yeah, it, it is, in my opinion, the best history. Um, well, depending on what you count my number one. My number two is Hamlet, um, because of course. And then my number one, my favorite Shakespeare play is King Lear, which I guess is kind of a history, but it's also the least historical of all of his histories. Um, so King Lear, which is one of his great tragedies, written uh, probably 1606-ish. Um, this is one of those ones where the historical record is nowhere near precise enough to know exactly when King Lear was written. Um, but probably sometime around 1606, which puts it in sort of the latter phase of Shakespeare. This is when King James I was monarch, so it's after Queen Elizabeth. Um, and King Lear, 
so so I guess just like generally with Shakespeare, um, the thing that I, they, there are kind of two things I love about Shakespeare. One is like the language itself, um, how he writes, the usage of um, iambic pentameter, which is the poetic meter that he uses um, for most of his uh, writing. Um, if you want some particularly good iambic pentameter, Romeo and Juliet, um, that's one of like the main things I like about that play is that he has a lot of lines of iambic pentameter that are shared between multiple characters that they begin and then end with different characters, um, which is like a remarkable feat of dialogue writing and poetry. And so his turns of phrase and his language is obviously a huge factor into Shakespeare and why I adore him. Um, but also his like mastery of structure of storytelling with plotting and character is like nearly unparalleled. Um, and I think that is one of the reasons why King Lear is my favorite is that I think it is the Shakespeare play that most has Shakespeare kind of step more into the background. Because a lot of his writing, um, I feel like sometimes it, there's a little bit too sh much Shakespeare in there, by which I mean that like there's too much kind of showing off with the language. There's too many really long soliloquies. Like Hamlet is the one that gets hit the hardest by this, even though Hamlet is very good. It's also extremely long. It's too long. Hamlet's always cut down some of the most severely of any of his plays. Um, and, you know, there's just too much navel-gazing, soliloquizing um, in a lot of his plays. And King Lear, like, I, like, it's hard for me to pull out, like, here is, like, the excerpt from King Lear I want to read. I have one that I will read, but it is not about the huge speeches. Like, there's a couple of smaller soliloquies throughout it, um, a couple in the beginning, like the Edmund one, which I won't read, but it's very good. His, like, bastard one. If you like Game of Thrones, you like bastards. Edmund, that's the original bastard speeches, Edmund's bastard, bastardy base, all that stuff. Um, but most of King Lear is way more kind of narrative driven than it is sort of poetically driven um, for a Shakespeare play. And there's something about that that um, makes it both, I think, the most fun play to read if you're just going to read one of his plays because you're just like following the story. Um, it also is like a joy to watch performed. I particularly like the BBC production that they did. It's like a filmed version of it um, that's very theater-like. Um, so it basically is taking place on a stage um, just without an audience. And it has Ian McKellen play King Lear. Um, there's also, I do want to shout out, a graphic novel adaptation by a novelist named uh, Gareth Hind, who does a whole series of graphic novel adaptations of classics. And his King Lear adaptation is fucking phenomenal. Um, his use of art there to communicate the themes of King Lear are so good. Um, and the themes of King Lear are all about like memory and identity. Um, and identity in particular is one of like the predominant themes that carries across most of Shakespeare's works. He's really interested in disguises um, and hiding oneself and exposing oneself both as a trick for the dramatic to have this like actor be able to kind of challenge themselves to play multiple versions of a character and then reveal themselves very dramatically at the end to be this person. Um, and a lot of his comedies particularly focus on that. But I also think he's just really interested in this idea of like what makes a person who they are. Um, and that sometimes would also rub up against the interests of the monarchy at the time. Um, and that you, if you're in this very strict classist society where you are in your class and that's where you are and that's where you're going to stay. Um, I think Shakespeare likes to push the boundaries of that and, you know, look at a character like King Lear, who is the king who is also like one of the most flawed and sort of fallible of all of Shakespeare's characters, because this is this old man who is sort of losing his grip on reality as he's slowly falling into dementia. Um, you have multiple disguises for multiple different characters. You have the Edgar Edmund subplot, which is phenomenal. And Edgar's whole journey of being the legitimate prince, who's an idiot, um, and then being kicked out by Edmund, the bastard, um, who is like way more accomplished. And then Edgar's having to sort of strip himself down to nothing become a crazed beggar named Tom of Bedlam and then from that nothingness rebuild himself back up into this the favor of his father and then at the end challenge Edmund as an anonymous knight and so Edgar transitions between multiple different identities to eventually earn back the spot he is given by society as the heir to um, this royal house of Gloucester um, and then you have of course all the main drama of King Lear and his daughters uh, Goneril and Regan who get the rest of his kingdom, and then his uh, spurned daughter Cordelia. Uh, so the section I want to read from King Lear comes at the very end. Um, it's one of the last speeches given. Um, it is Lear. So the whole, the play is basically over. Lear has, like, everyone's like, we have won. We've done it. Like, we defeated Edmund. We, like, stopped this plot of to, like, overthrow the kingdom with Goneril and Regan. 
Um, and we just have to make sure we get the king and Cordelia back. And Edmund says, I have set this plot into motion that King Lear and Cordelia are going to be hanged by this, by one of my servants. And Edmund dies. Um, and then as soon as that happens from off stage, Lear comes in, bringing, cradling the body of his daughter who has died. And King Lear slew the guy who killed her. Um, and then you have a, a series of speeches and conversations back with other characters as Lear is grieving. Um, and then it ultimately culminates in this speech um, by King Lear. Hold on, I lost my place. Uh, here it is. So Lear is there with her body. Um, and he says, And my poor fool is hanged. No, no, no life. Why should a dog, a horse, a rat have life and thou no breath at all? That will come no more. Never, 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 never. Pray you undo this button. Thank you, sir. Do you see this? Look on her. Look her lips. Look there. Look there. And then he dies. Um, and this is the last moment of Lear as he is grieving. He he's, can't comprehend why Cordelia would have to die and all else of life has to continue on. And then he ends in this last moment of dementia where he sees this sign of life in her that is not there. And then he dies. Um, and it is like one of the most, when you see a proper Shakespearean actor perform the scene, it is, I think, like the most effective of all the tragic endings and it is my favorite single line of iambic pentameter in all of shakespeare is this line never 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 which is one line of iambic pentameter 10 syllables um of one word which is an i am never repeated five times um and again when you see a proper actor like ian mckellen perform that scene the way that you can just sort of relish on that line and what it does linguistically in the most like simple obvious way possible um, is so powerful. And so it's, and it is like the culmination of what Shakespeare is at his best, which is, I think, this pure fusion of powerful plotting, clear, direct characterization, um, combined with this like language that pulls out all of the emotions of the drama directly um, in a way that is like utterly remarkable. Um, and so Shakespeare, obviously, like I could go for it. We could do the full Shakespeare podcast one day if we want to. If I have to pick my one Shakespeare to be representative on this list, it is King Lear. It's funny. King Lear is one of the only ones um, that you went through on your 10 that I have not like read as a text. Um, I have seen it. I've seen, there are so many good also like adaptations in different ways. You mentioned a couple, but like Kurosawa's Ron all, yeah. obviously is one that um, is not a, not a super close adaptation, but a very clear inspiration for that movie. Um, and it is phenomenal. Um, but yeah, I, I did not include a Shakespeare because they're just, I just couldn't kind of like, none of the ones that I really love, I feel like I've, I have ever felt the same way with like them as a text as I do like the books on my list, you know, I think mm -hmm. of them as plays or I think of them as movies or, or as things to be read. Um, I think the closest two would be Hamlet and Romeo and Juliet and Romeo and Juliet. I know the best as a text. And I think if I were to pick one for a list like this, it would be Romeo and Juliet exactly for what you said about like the language and, and the poetry of it. It is so phenomenally done that way. Uh, Hamlet is probably my favorite to like see performed. Um, but my favorites to read, I actually agree with you, are a lot of the histories. I think the histories often yeah. are a little more plot driven. Um, and, and yes, Henry IV, I will stand Henry IV Part One because it's good. And Henry IV Part II is, is kind of boring and bad, but it has good stuff with... Um, um, Falstaff. Uh, Falstaff, yes. Now, I totally knew his name, and I was testing if you knew it. Um, yeah, Henry the Fourth yes. Part Two is a mostly boring play that has like a, just a killer last scene. Um, if people are interested yes. in those, you should watch um, Chimes of Midnight, which is the Orson Welles movie that adapts and kind yeah. of combines Part One and Part Two of Henry the Fourth from the perspective of Falstaff, who's played by Welles, and it like it it sort of like redeems Henry the Fourth Part Two a little bit for me by just sort of taking all the cruft out of it, um, and it like really makes the last scene where Hal becomes Henry the fourth um, or Henry the fifth and then must reject Falstaff as this part of his life that he can't go back to. And it lands really hard there, but yeah, Shakespeare's very yeah. good. I don't know if people's heard, have heard Shakespeare did some good <laughs> shit. Um, he was quite good at what he did. Underrated, but you know, if you haven't heard of him, yeah, little known author tell you. and playwright. Yeah. William Shakespeare. All right, Sean, let's, let's call it a day for now. We're not going to call it a day, but for the podcast, let's say this is a two-parter. Yeah, that's I think this a is smart long. idea. Yeah, we got to make yeah. this a two-parter. 
So, okay, everyone, uh, thank you for listening to Podcast 350. We will be back at you next week with Podcast 351, where we will do the top five of our top ten books. Um, But I think we covered a whole shit ton of ground this week. And I think we're going to cover a whole shit ton of ground next week. Um, So our, our 350 celebration will continue into next week. We're not going anywhere, but you will have a week to listen to this. Um, And thank you again for being here for 350 fucking episodes of the Weekly Stuff Podcast. And I think you'll really enjoy the 351st one if you want to hear me read out something that is maybe arguably not English. And you will get um, a preview of what we will have in uh, the next episode. So enjoy that.